Welcome everybody. This is the um, March 7th Battery Park City Committee meeting. Um, we got moved from last week, so thank you all for attending and I appreciate your flexibility. Um, I am Justine Cuccia and I am the chair of this committee. My co-chair is Kathy Gupta. Kathy, wave, smile and wave if you want to. Um, we've got on this call, I'm going to do it as, in the order I see it. I see Robin Forrest, who's a public member. I see, see Eric Flores, Kathy Gupta, Bob Schneck, Rosa Chang, who's not a member of this committee, but she is a welcome member of the board, and Sarah Cassell, and uh, Jeff um, Galloway is going to be signing in a little bit late, he said. So, um, on, I said Bob Schneck, right? Um, but he will be here any minute. So, we're going to get started, though. Um, I want to remind everybody on the call that the way this works is Robert rules, which means that um, everybody's going to have a chance to speak, but you raise your hand so it's an orderly fashion. Um, the, the board members that I just announced would be have the ability to go first, and I'll call on them. And then anyone in the in the attendee section, you're muted and we can't see your picture, but you raise your hand, um, which is by going to the reactions section, and then it says raise hand. I believe that's correct, or, or no, though, no, that's not right. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. So raise hand. So like this is raising your hand, this is lowering your hand. And uh, if you're on a phone, I think you have to do star something. What is it? Um, anybody remember? Star six. Star six. Star mute. Star three is to raise your hand, I think. Okay, perfect. And that's it. With that getting going, we are going to give Patrick Murphy a treat this time and let him go first with his security update. So, Patrick, unmute yourself and take it away. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, okay, for the report dealing with graffiti is our first one on the line. So in 2021, we had three reports uh, for this month. Uh, for this year, we had four. Dealing with homeless, we had zero last year, and we have three reports this year. Lost and found property. Uh, was zero last year, and this year we have three. Park rules, last year we had three, this year we have 12. Uh, vendor solicit, uh, solicitation, zero and zero for both. And for dogs, we had four reports last year, and this year we have two. And that's really it. That's it. All right. Um... Let's see, what am I going to ask you? And I don't see any folks on here that are going to talk about it. So we're going to wait till a little bit later to talk about it. But um, thank you. Um, you can stick around if you like to. Does anybody on the committee have any questions? Not at this, that's cool. Um, and I think that- Justine, these numbers are in my report, of course, as always. Yes, of course, at the end, of, if, if you want to show it at the end, but- uh, do we have any, any marches coming up or anything coming up that you could tell us about? I do, actually. Um, yes. Uh, Lucian, would you do the honors, please? And good evening, everyone. Justine, you know, while he's bringing it up, I have to tell you, there are many things I have to thank you for, but one of the things is I never, and I mean never leave the office at like 5.15. I'm usually there for <laughs> God knows what hour. But on Battery Park City Committee meeting nights, I leave because I want to make sure I'm back here and settled in for the meeting to go to an indeterminate time, although you've been doing and Lucian as well. I've been, I've yeah. been doing great to make keep them manageable. So thank you for helping me at least once a month get home um, at a reasonable hour. I'll be it working for a few hours thereafter. Okay. Uh, right. If you scroll down, Lucian, to the last page, uh, just do a quick control end there. We added in um, just a couple of things coming up. Uh, right there, there's actually Pat stats and then the blue. So, as you know, or the group knows or may know, the 9 11 Memorial and Museum does their annual walkathon and community day each April. It has been uh, set this April uh, for Sunday, this year, I should say, rather for Sunday, April 24th. That's usually when it takes place. It's usually that last week or so of April. Um, it's a large event and it uh, includes. Uh, you know, a number of community partners, police and fire, first responders, et cetera. 
um, we'll have more details to come, but I just wanted to get it on your radar that it is uh, looking at April 24th. If it's helpful to you, Justine and Lucian, we can make the outreach, although I, I think you have some contacts there as well. Perhaps we can have some of the organizers um, come to the committee just to kind of catch you up on what their thoughts are. I think it's it's mostly the same. There may be some minor root changes, but uh, in the main, that's that's the big event coming up. And then the Colloquius School, Dutch King's Day, that's just a small event for kids. That's on the 30th of April. So again, we have some time on these, a month more or so on each. Uh, but that's a smaller event on Esplanade Plaza on Saturday morning, April 30th. I will have more in my April report coming up uh, in April and May, but for now, those are the ones that we're tracking. One larger event, one relatively smaller event that hadn't taken place in a couple of years, but now that we are knock on wood almost through the pandemic, it's, uh, we're starting to see some of these smaller events come back as well. Thanks, Justine. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for doing this stuff. Um, and folks on the call and on the board, um, remember that as this as the season starts to pick up, we've, we've been kind of, uh, I guess one good side of COVID has been there's been <laughs> not so many runs and not so many walks. So I guess my question is, and I was looking, and then I saw another thing from Pamit. Um, when's Mother's Day? So April second Sunday in May. Second Sunday in May. So it's always, the, always the second Sunday in May. Yeah. In May. Okay. So not so April. Is... Easter is earlier and Passover is earlier. So that's good. So Mother's Day would be what May May eighth May eighth I guess May eighth. Yes, Mother Day is May eighth. Okay, just making sure with the with the walk, just to kind of get a sense of it all. But thank you, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then the more advanced notice we have as these things come through, the better it is, so people can weigh in and ask questions about it. And this 9-11 memorial run has happened before with no problems. Yeah, I mean, you know, other than the run of the mill kind of just general stuff, I don't recall anything major. It's a, uh, it, but it's a significant downtown event, and it's put on by uh, the memorial, who are mm -hmm. right across the way. Yeah, um, this is their annual uh, their annual five k. And as you know, there's a large community kind of uh, aspect to it as well, open to the public, food and events, and uh, just a really nice day for everyone to. Uh, to get together. It's kind of like the bookend of the Stephen Siller, which happens around September. This is kind of the, yeah. not exactly so, the same event, but the same kind of idea. So upper lower plaza. So it's going to be outside in front of Brookfield. Yes, in the Marina area, and then yep. it's going to be a run as well along the Esplanade, right? I guess mm -hmm. a 5K. Yep. So you're going to get back and forth, but it's just, just going to be inside of it. The Esplanade. Yes, I believe so. I have to get your specifics on the route, which I will. Yeah, let us know. And and I don't know if anybody has any questions about it, but I, it's, I'm rusty. It's been two plus years since we've had to talk about this. So I know. I know. I'm rusty. Sorry. It's okay. All right. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, Lucian, sure. I think we'll jump now back to um, the agenda. And let's see if Pamit has signed on yet. He has not signed on yet. I was gonna let him go next, but if he's not here, right? Am I missing it? I don't see Bamin. Right, I don't see him either. All right, well, do we wanna start talking about South End Avenue? Yeah, that works. Cause I think that's next, can you pull the agenda up? I think that's next on the agenda. Let's see what he says. Um, yeah, I don't see him. Sorry. Okay, Nick, you're up with the South End Avenue street yeah. street skate project. Justine, you know, you're that tackle first tonight. I'm thinking maybe I'll just end up doing my whole report. No, I'm. I'm kidding. No, I'm not letting you do your whole report. We got we got to talk about this stuff. I'm kidding. Um, yes, uh, what I actually did do in my report, just on the off chance that you were feeling, oh, I don't know, generous. I. Uh, <laughs> I put in my report as well, which, as you all know, was posted to the site. I put in my report the um, the up the South End Avenue agenda, uh, the South End Avenue item. Uh, so let me just open that up, and Lucian, if you wouldn't mind, it is on page. Uh, I think it's probably five or so. Yes, page five in the report. Uh, if you could bring that up. 
So for the benefit of the folks who may be uninitiated, I know Justine has a good amount of history here, Lucian as well. I believe maybe he was just getting started as, as district manager. Um, but we had for a number of years been working with hand and glove. I, I know I use these examples often, but it's a it's actually a good way of explaining how we work hand in glove with the community board on a lot of kind of big ticket items and have. Um, over the course of a number of years, first when I had first begun at the DPCA, so it was 2016 or so, and even predating my time, there's been a lot of talk about the traffic conditions on South End Avenue and uh, West Thames Street. Now this was a this was a thoroughfare that was built, you know, obviously in the 1980s. It was built probably larger than it needs to be given um, given some of the uses of it as a, in a residential neighborhood, et cetera. Long story short, and I say long story short because as Lucian will have, there was a very lengthy and comprehensive and good resolution that the community board had passed in 2018, working hand in glove with us and with the Department of Transportation on concepts for what a redesigned South End Avenue and West Thames Street streetscape might look like. Um, widened sidewalks, narrower streets, which uh, leads to, um, you know, less traffic uh, and other ideas for, you know, beautifying the space, but also making it a little narrower and essentially aimed for aimed at traffic calming and uh, pedestrian safety. So long story short, we are now getting geared up to put an RFP out on the street at the uh, by the end of the month. So next time I come before you in April, I'll be able to say the RFP is out. Now, Nick, what does that mean? Oh my God, the RFP. If I was segmenting this out into various stages, and the folks who have been with us for a while understand how it works, it's the RFP to actually do the design, not to start the work yet, right? So what we have done to the community with the community board to date. Is developed con and the Department of Transportation, uh, et cetera, and stakeholders is to develop some concepts about what we'd like to see along South End Avenue and West Thames Street to ease traffic and improve pedestrian safety outcomes. We have taken all that feedback. The resolution that the community board passed forms the basis for what will be the language in the RFP. What the RFP then does is okay, hey, we're putting this request for proposals out for potential designers to do the design work on what we want this new streetscape to look like. So we are in the pre-design phase of the project. The RFP goes out, that, that kind of kicks off the process of putting the word out to vendors, receiving bids in a competitive fashion, reviewing the bids, negotiating, coming up with a contract, bringing the the consultant firm on board to do the design work. And then many of you know, with all of our projects, it comes with it the very fulsome community engagement aspect. So there will be like a kickoff meeting saying, hey, this is firm X that has been, that has won the bid to do the design work on South End Avenue. Here is now the initial meeting. Here are the folks you'll be working with. Here is the schedule of public input meetings over the course of the next X number of months to actually do the design work. So the next round of community feedback comes when the design phase starts as we further refine the pedestrian safety concepts to square with some very practical matters. Because what we've done so far, um, Lucian has both the resolution and then also the last presentation we did to the community board. It's a PDF, Lucian, you can share that link and it'll also be on the, on the site. Those are concepts, but what the designer will do is then actually work through those concepts to square with very practical matters, utilities placement, what are the subsurface conditions look like, what exactly is the optimum sidewalk width or the maintenance considerations, et cetera. And then what we have the concepts for will be, we'll use that as a baseline and we'll be able to refresh those considerations on appropriate street width and dimensions based on traffic calming features, materials, uh, et cetera. So there are um, a lot of considerations still to be uh, worked through. I'd also note, as some of you have noted to me, that the nature and value of the concept to today. Um, so what we would do is incorporate a lot of those now new facts on the ground 
into the design process as well. So excited to get started. Um, it is again the beginning of well, actually even pre, but the, the beginning or before the start of the design process. And we look forward to working that through with you uh, as we go with the next touch point being the RFP for the designer to be bid out uh, by month's end. So that's the long and the short of it. Hopefully that wasn't too long. No, that's great, Nick. Thank you. So um, what Lucian is showing on the screen now is that is the res well before the, this resolution is showing up here was the presentation. So if you want to go back just quick before we go through it, Nick, to, to the. Sure, uh, it's been uh, it's been a while since I looked at it. It's been a while. So, have to forget. so um, bottom line is everybody should understand what Nick is talking about with um, Latonia, I'm going to just take it inside and open it and then come back. Sorry, it's loud. Um, so if you go to the okay. next page and show the three, the three points, I think it's the next page. Lucian, sorry, if I had control, I'd do it myself. Lucian? I've advanced it. Do you see the advance? No, it's still frozen on the first page. Sorry. It'll catch up. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it may be it may be just some slow throughput. Um, if helpful, Justine and Lucian as well, you know, in the in the resolution as well, the resolution does a really good job of breaking out the three sections. It does. And everybody should really go and look at the sections. So here we go. So the way that they worked it was the north section is Liberty Street from between so between Liberty and Albany Street. Yep. And that's the area that needs the most work because it is the most congested. As anybody who lives in Gateway and is walking um north to south, especially on the gateway side of the of South End Avenue knows you can't open the doors to the stores oh, without being like bumped off the street. You know, it's it's com it's it's crowded. So here there's definitely work. Very board meeting. So I don't know. Um, you might as well just go and eat. Um, so in the next section, the central section is Rector is between Albany and Rector. And I think that has got controversy associated with it. We'll talk about that. And then the West Thames Street section also has some issues with it. All of this was addressed by the 2018 resolution, which Lucian, now you can pull it up. Sorry, but I just want you to know what they're talking about when they're saying North section, central and south. Um, the pictures don't make sense anymore. And I guess, Nick, what I would say, um, and I'll probably say it again, is that this resolution and this plan, as you said, this was what was done back in 2018. Right? I think this plan was put together maybe in 2017 or 2016. And then the resolution itself was written in 2018, July. We need a, a soft reboot based on new changes. I mean, since this resolution was written, there's been a traffic light installed at West at a uh, South end and rector. There's been stop signs put in. So I think that that is going to have an effect on the traffic coming concerns that were raised and uh, look to be addressed. So Lucian, you're going to have to work with me on this 1, because I don't want to go through everything. But if we go down to where we start talking about the divided plans, okay, so we've got North. No, no, you go too fast. A little bit lower so I can um, higher. Yeah, sorry. You got to go to the higher part. Higher, higher, higher. Sorry. I'm going to do the north section. So we've got north. Uh, I'm doing it on my computer too so I can see it. Okay, so changes for the north section. So we've got north section, which goes from Liberty to Albany, central, south end to rep, uh, which is rector to Albany. So we're looking at the north section now. And so here we talked about where the taxi line cab line is going to go by Liberty Street, and they're going to move it from where it is now in front of LPQ to the other side of the street. Is that correct? Or is it extended? So Nick, work with me here. Jump, um, unbump yourself and help me out. Taxi cab line is extended to northwest side on Liberty Street. Taxi cab line added to the southwest side of Liberty Street facing east. These are things that are proposed. Daytime commercial evening alternate side of the street parking. We're going to keep that and they're adding some to the north and south of Liberty streets. Commercial parking changes from 3 hours to 2 hours to try to get people to move along. Um, and they're going to do a study, which is nice. They want to add bike lanes all along. 
and curb bump outs well, were gonna be installed on the southeast portion of the intersection at South End and Liberty Street. Christine? Yes, ma'am. I don't know where the hand race uh, yeah, is. No, it's okay, just talk, because I'm not even, I can't look, I can't do two things. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to say is since this was done in 25, let's say five years ago, yeah. there has been uh, an incredible, incredible proliferation of black cars. Mm -hmm. um, they were there when this was done. But I don't know how that's being accounted for. Um, this is really addressed to Nick, really, uh, in terms of the taxi. We've seen a huge change in the taxi yeah. industry. Um, you know, maybe it will have a, a comeback, but the kinds of lines that defined this study five years ago are not the current reality. But the black cars, the Ubers, the cul-de-sac at Brookfield that has increasing amounts of traffic. I think are considerations that um, have to be incorporated into whatever comes next. That's a good point. And I don't think convene, I don't remember quite frankly, but was convene even a factor at the time of all this or did it come in after? I, I think it came in after and um, yeah. that was a concern that we raised with the convene people that, and there was an agreement, if you recall, that they were supposed to Try I to do I their drop offs on so. Easy Street. I believe convene is. I believe convene is the intervening period. Intervening yeah. meaning, yeah, in between. Right. That's what I said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. So okay, yeah. This the resolutions happened. This that this this plan happened. The resolution happened. So in this resolution, we do give some parameters. We talk about where the buses are going to go. Um, I don't want to go through the whole thing because basically, Nick, what I want to say to you guys, and then I'm going to open it up. Yep. And what I want to say is stuff has changed um, of concern to the folks by by gateway are um, the medians. Now, if I read this correctly, and I remember correctly, you're still going to have a pedestrian refuge island, which is an actual median. That's going to be like right in front of uh, LPQ, just a little spit there. Correct. And then you're going to have a break for the garage. And there'll be some way for people going north on South End to make a left turn into Gateway Garage or Gateway yeah. Plaza, you know, whatever. There's the there's the cul-de-sac there. Um, and then on the other side of it, you're going to have a full-blown median that's going to be blocking South End Avenue. Am I correct with that? Or do we cut that back down? And Nick, I'm asking you, oh, you're, you know, you're having trouble with your connectivity. I see it like. A little sign there. So are you there? Yeah. No, it's okay. Can 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 you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Justine, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, we can. I'm sorry. Yeah, my okay. The video was. I don't know why my video is backing up, but my That's if you you can hear my audio. Yes. Okay. So um, yeah, like I said, so this was kind of the state of play as of July 2018, based on what we had worked through, mm -hmm. uh, when the designer comes on board, they will have to incorporate everything that is now uh, facts on the ground and incorporate that into um, what the what the what the design becomes. So they will have to they will have to kind of uh, uh, fit appropriately the concepts into what can be done realistically speaking based on what the situations are on the ground and what has changed in the intervening period. And when that, and Jeff, I'm going to call on you in a second. When that happens, you're going to come back to us so that we can do the same kind of in-depth block by block discussion, correct? Before anything gets done. Yeah, I mean, Justine, I imagine there will be, you know, a not significant amount of meetings on this, like resiliency level project number. Okay, meetings. cool. Because yeah, this is a big project for us here. So all right, yeah, Jeff, there you go. There you go, Jeff. Go ahead, unmute yourself and go. Um, yeah, I just. Picking up on this point of lots of things have changed uh, since 2018, 2016, whenever it was that these considerations were made. Um, I, I, I really think that almost everything, I'm, all I can see right now is this particular section of the North section, but I think every single thing here needs to be uh, rethought. I mean, for example, the median. Right now, with all the, I mean, the, the taxi stand is essentially not used at all, maybe there's two taxis there in a in a in a busy time, um, but it 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 does make it difficult for 
the Ubers to drop off there. So they tend to double park. If there were a median that would completely block that traffic, uh, Ubers use the bus stop also uh, to drop off and, and pick up. And then, of course, the backup from the gateway garage is as bad as it ever was, yep. uh, which tends to get backed up behind the Ubers. Right now, people get into either get past that line by going in the middle of what would become a median, uh, which would further clog the traffic. So I, th I think I'm not saying that a median is a bad idea. I mean, it, it is it is treacherous to cross South End Avenue as a pedestrian. Um, and it's even more treacherous if you're a young child or elderly or need to take you know special time mm -hmm. to to get across traffic is coming in like five different directions um at, at once right uh, but you know maybe it's right. narrowing similar to what was done on vz street is better than putting in a median i don't know what the answer is but i think people with traffic expertise really need to look at it in light of the very significantly changed you know universe of of, of taxis versus ubers the the drastic increase in deliveries um, uh, in, in this period of time, um, you know, combined with different modes of deliveries that are used now. There's lots of people with the bicycle trailers instead of vans parking in the middle. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's just the usages have just changed a lot. Uh, certainly the road can be um, uh, improved, um, but I'm not sure that hardly I think every single one of our bullet points probably needs to be revisited in light of the change circumstances. And that's only the north section, but yes, I agree with you because and it may be similar for the others. I haven't looked at the others yet, but you know, as you say, there's a yeah. traffic light there now that solves some of the problems that were there. So before. we're going to keep going, but someone else had their hand raised. I just speak up if you're on the board because I can't see. Just you. wanted to. Uh, ooh, where am I? You, I just I wanted to you. say again to, um, you know, I mean. Jeff basically echoed what I said, but I, having worked at the authority when this was being discussed was a very different time in history. Yeah. And the idea that an RFP is being prepared uh, based on five years ago, to me, uh, does not seem like a smart thing to do. And I don't know, um, Nick, if Gwen and you know, those folks who are in design have taken a close look in light of the changes, but um, I, I think it doesn't make sense without a thorough review in advance of, you know, the RFP going out, my, that's my a, opinion. That's an interesting point, Robin. And Nick, um, I think it's fair because we're kind of throwing this at you right now to think about that and maybe have you know, go go back to Gwen, go back to the authority folks and just get a sense from them what they think makes a process. Do we want to do a working group like we did last time? Do you want to have this on the agenda to actually have the folks come in and we hash it through? Because we spent, as you know, we spent weeks and months going through this very, very carefully. And um, and Pat, you hold on a second because I'm going to get to you when we get to the central section, but which is next, but we, we spent a lot of time going through all this so carefully. And I do think a lot of it is changing. Because of the different circumstances I and mean, get COVID. It's just, this is a different neighborhood than it was 5 years ago. Or, or it's in 2018 at yeah, 2018 is 5 years. So those are things to take into consideration. Had this been done in, in 2019 or 2020, we, we would have been stuck with it because that was the situation then. But a lot has changed. Um, let's switch to the, unless, well, you know what, Pat, unmute yourself and speak. If you want to speak about the North section, if you want to go to central, let's look at that 1st, and then I'll let you speak, but go ahead. You're here. So you can unmute. Go ahead. Am I unmuted now? We can hear you. Okay. This is on the central section. So you central want me to wait? Section. Um, yeah, hold on 1 sec. Cause I think Fine. we're kind of done. Does anybody else have anything to say about the North section? This was at the time, the least controversial. Because the authority worked with us. So let me say this, as much as this is a lot of information here and we're giving you a hard time, the authority really did work with us. So I expect you to do it again, Nick, as usual with conversations and, and communication and transparency. They did work with us to get to a place for the North section. I think the biggest holdout 
that for myself was the insistence on having medians that were you know, full medians, which mean like now we have medians that are yellow painted lines. So cars can drive through them, trucks could park on them, but they're a visual impediment. They're talking about a physical median in the middle of the road, which will narrow and, you know, yeah, it's going to slow traffic, certainly. But I, my concern has always been it's going to block traffic. But that's my concern. Um, and this is a group where we're giving advisory opinions and we're presenting the community's views. And the community did agree with the North at the time, five years ago, with the North section, they were okay with, with this as given. I think that there's things that need to be changed now based on the changes. But I'm going to look for the committee first. Anybody besides Pat, because we're going to go to Pat for the central. And I can't see um, if any attendees. Uh, I see Kelly has his hand raised. So Kelly, if you're going to be speaking to the to the north, you are recognized. So un unmute Kelly, Lucian. And um, if it's central, keep him unmuted. But Kelly, just wait. You know, wait your turn. But. I think Lucian's going to unmute you. He has to request it and then you have to do it. There you go. Go ahead, Kelly. Are you North section or central right now? You need to recognize the, the current reality versus 5 years ago. So Jeff said it perfectly. So I won't reiterate that. But I would just point out as a reminder. When we went from 2 lanes in both directions to a median in 1 lane. Yep. Had the huge benefit of keeping the delivery trucks largely off the side streets under people's windows, which was yes. a very common problem. Um, and, the, and no matter how much we we fought for making sure they turned the engines off, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That was largely addressed by having them off the side streets. So I think we all love to see bike lanes, median tree line streets and, and wide sidewalks, but we have to have a plan that sort of recognizes reality, not what we want it to be. Yep. And, and if, unless we have a, a good solution for the delivery trucks, um, you know, we have to, you know, that's it. We don't want to force them back to the side streets and under people's windows. So, yeah, really good point, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. Um, so, Nick, you're hearing it again that the medians are an issue from more people than me. All right, Lucian, will you scroll to central section and then um, I'm going to. Let people read for a second and recognize Pat. So I know what you're going to say, Pat, and I'm going to give you the floor. But Lucian, you should scroll for center. There you go. All right, Justine, thank you very much. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, when this uh, plan was first surfaced three or four years ago, the boards of six, count them, six condos along South End Avenue below Albany Street took the position that you have a problem north of Albany Street. Whatever you want to do to work out that problem, to address that problem, to solve that problem, please, we will support you. We will be behind you 100%. South of Albany Street, we do not have a problem. Yeah. So we are able to you know, take deliveries. We are able you know, to... to the trucks park in the middle of the street. That's ugly, but you know, as Kelly pointed out, it's a reality and it keeps them off the side streets. Yep. And to go to the expense of even, you know, with it, with an RFP to start working on fixing a problem that doesn't exist south of Albany street is a waste of our uh, ground rent dollars. So fix what you need to fix north of Albany Street. We support you 100%. South of Albany Street, we don't want to widen our sidewalks. Right now, our sidewalks on the west side of the street are 25 feet wide. The plan that was surfaced would widen them five feet more. <laughs> And when you cut into the traffic lane and widen the sidewalk, you are inviting motorized two wheel vehicles to ride on the sidewalk. You are increasing the danger to pedestrians. Yes, good by point. Doing that. Uh, right now, when I get home on a weekend, I pull up in front of my building 
I have to double park to unload my car. And because the street is so wide, it is not a problem. People can get around me. The pro proposal you would have, I would not be able to do that. Uh, trucks, you know, the proposal calls for some truck parking on West Thames and hoping that the people parking the trucks there would go up to 100 yards to make deliveries. It's just not reasonable to expect that to happen. Again, we are in good shape south of Albany Street. Don't spend your money down here. Spend your money between Albany and Liberty where you've got a lot of problems. So I have six condo, condo resolutions. I yes. shared them with Justine the other day. You can have them. Yeah, yeah we it, shared them so you know, Paul, uh, you know, so you know, Pat, um, the committee has been, that's been shared with the committee. If it's possible uh, and you're okay with it, which I think you would be, can we place them on the community board website as well, Lucian? Please, absolutely do it, yes. I, I think and, that would be and again, you know, and, and again, we'll make sure they're available if somebody wants them. Say again. I can make sure they're available if someone wants them. Okay, so if, if anybody wants to see them, um, Lucian, we'll put your email in the chat or, or reach out to Lucian. And um, I suggest everybody looks at them so that anybody who has a position on this should, should weigh in and get some information because you're hearing from the people and the buildings that are surrounding um, this portion of the, of the project. Remember, you're coming um, down, you're coming, my building, Battery Point, runs yep. the entire length of South End Avenue from Rector to West Thames. Yep. And you're going to come along here now and tell me I must widen my sidewalks by five feet, adding to the cost of maintaining those sidewalks, uh, and reducing my ability to double park and unload my car on a weekend, and, uh, in general, just uh, disrupting truck parking, which, like I said, it's not pretty, the truck's parking in its center median, but it works, and it's the best possible solution. And that is all I have to say at this point. Thank you for the time. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Pat, because, yeah, so, so Nick, once again, um, and something that I think we don't need, and I think you might want to agree with this, is the raised table. So what that was is it's kind of like a speed bump, but because they're buses, it has to be more like a table. Uh, it's bigger than, you know, wider, whatever the right word is, than a speed bump. Just because buses are so big, if it was a speed bump, the buses would get their undercarriages smashed. With and the that, that, raised, that raised table is, is was, yeah, was we don't need that. Advanced because we were told we would not be able to get a traffic light. Right, exactly. We got, we got the, the traffic, traffic light. light. Mm -hmm. So again, it is just an expense we do not need to undertake. Well, right. And and to be fair to, to the authority and to Nick right now, I don't know that that's still on the table. This is just what's raised in the resolution because that was being presented back then. Right. So, Nick, I'm not going to make you answer because you're hearing from us and I'm just going to ask you to take it all back to your folks. I mean, and, I mean unless you want to, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, I guess is my point. Um, anybody, Kelly, your hand is still raised. Do you want to say something about the central section? Since you can. <laughs> No, this is great. This is exactly where we want to have this yeah. conversation. Nick, is that you talking? Yeah, you're breaking up again. Yeah. So sorry. Can't hear you. Nope, I don't hear you. I do see Robin's hand up. So, do, Robin, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just want to, you know, re-echo what we've been talking about, how different the world is today than it was. And um, without seeming to be too philosophical, I think if um, there's anything we've learned as a community in the last couple of years with the pandemic is that we need to prioritize what's important. And uh, what may have been important in 2016 or 17, uh, the North End is definitely an issue and continues to be an issue. The other areas, among other reasons, were, you know, to make it more habitable, to make it prettier, to make it nicer. And I uh, have to question 
the appropriateness of that now, particularly in light of the costs that are being borne uh, by the condominiums and indirectly by the rental properties. I think that we as a community need to decide what's important and not um, continue with the plan that seemed like the right thing five or six years ago. So I, I would encourage, uh, as you have, uh, Nick and BJ and company, to really, before an RFP is issued, to really think hard and maybe have a community meeting uh, to discuss what this is about at this moment in time and the appropriateness of this at this moment in time. So it, with that, I'm going to hear you say, up. Robin, and then Nick, I'll, I'm going to call Patrick and you too. Um, but, but it's interesting to hear you say this because it's different conversation from the folks by gateway. And you're even saying by Liberty street, you're not looking so much for a change or no, maybe I, you I want think some North, change. I think the North end needs improvement. I mean, the situation okay. is terrible. Pat, uh echoed that i think yeah. you all know okay. it it's so a, that's the that's, lived experience which okay. is terrible but south of albany i'm not sure that there really is a compelling need let's say i mean i don't see one but that doesn't mean that there isn't one but i think an evaluation and analysis um as to the costs and the benefit and what will it bring us uh as a community and a community that's you know, facing challenges and continues to face challenges in terms of the real estate market um, and in terms of the ground rent, um, you know, all around, not only condominiums, the rental buildings have them and they're reflected in the rents. Exactly. But, but I do think that it's something that needs to be reevaluated um, in light of what's happened since you know, a really excellent plan was put together with a lot of work, a lot of hours spent by the community, by the authority, yep. an incredible amount of work. But sometimes, you know, as life changes, we need to change with it. And this may be the moment that we need to rethink the expenditure of this kind of money, the disruption to the community, which will certainly be incredibly large i mean it'll be large enough at the north end um but every time you rip up a sidewalk to widen it you know there uh, there are so many implications utilities traffic disruptions noise dust i mean just the list is is really long so well, that's, also that just to be easy. clear even though the north is a pro has problems that should be solved not necessarily the solution that was determined back in 2018. Ag agreed, that's Jeff. I, I said that when I spoke when I spoke yeah. before yeah. that the conditions are different. I think the North End clearly needs, you know, a, a, a do over of some sort. But you're right. Yeah. The one that was proposed in 2017 may not be the right, you know, the right uh, situation yeah. for the current situation. So I so. think what's clearly being said, and I think Jeff was kind of saying it to me, so I knew what was going on. What's clearly being said is that this resolution as written, it was approved for the conditions back then. It is not approved for the conditions today and we just need to revisit it. And maybe we need to do a little bit of work before they go through the expense of an RFP or doing that. That's what I'm hearing. Um, thank you, Pat. I don't think you had your hand raised, but maybe you did Pat. Oh, let's see who had their hand raised. I, I did. Pat Justin. Smith, go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. And then I'm going to call on Lana in the attendee section. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, Justine, thank you, but I did not have my hand raised. Oh, okay. It's it's it was raised. An old right hand. Thank Your you. old hand. Old hand. hand. Okay. I, no problem. Perfect. Justine? I didn't want to ignore anybody. Um, Justine, Lana, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Is that Nick? Justine. Yes. That's now me. I can. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to overrule, overrun you, but we when you fade out, we can't hear you. So, but go ahead. No, now no, no, it's completely okay. I, I don't know why I'm having throughput issues this evening. Apologies. So Lucian was kind enough to give me the dial in. So I'm I'm Perfect. in now. Okay. Um, so, yes, all of this is exactly what is supposed to happen. It's very valuable. Good. Um, that's why I opened up by saying the next round of feedback comes with the design phase, which we have not yet started. So, all of this feedback is really helpful. 
this should be exactly the conversation we have with the designer when the design process starts. It hasn't started yet, right? Okay. So we need to refine the concepts that are in the resolution with the practical matters on the ground that exist today as opposed to how they existed in July 2018, right? Mm -hmm. So utilities placement, as I said, subsurface materials, what the optimum sidewalk width is. I know we had discussed about maintenance considerations, et cetera. So the previous concept is kind of a baseline. It doesn't mean that it has to happen exactly as is, obviously, because they were concepts. Current traffic and streetscape conditions, including um, previously unexamined, uh, unexamined traffic generators, increase in bike traffic, Robin had mentioned black car traffic, et cetera. Yep. All of that has evolved significantly over the period immediately preceding and during the South End Avenue study and has continued to evolve, to evolve since the study was completed, right? Street level improvements have been made by Brookfield, the 200 Liberty, uh, as I said, that's bicycle traffic has improved, et cetera. So this is all part of the design phase. That RFP is the RFP to get a designer on board to have these conversations, including to make any changes you want in the north, even albeit if they have changed since. So okay. it's not not putting the RFP out. It is getting the designer on board to have these conversations because we all agree we do want changes on South End Avenue. We need the designer to actually go through that process. All right, so that's... What would probably be best is to have everyone kind of look through all the previous materials, get the thoughts together in a way that makes sense and say, hey, current state, here's what we want to see, and then come in armed with the best when we kick off the design phase, which itself comes with its, you know, multiple public touch points and community feedback sessions. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Make sense? So yeah. It makes sense to me. Let's see what let's see. Um Lana, if if Lucian, you can unmute Lana. Lana M in the chat. Uh, I'm new to this meeting. Um, so I'm just trying to catch up here, but I reviewed the proposal uh, PDF and it looks really good to me um, because I'm, I'm somebody who recently moved to the neighborhood actually during the pandemic and I have a dog that is very active. And so I walk around the neighborhood all the time and the sidewalks uh, both by Liberty Court, where I live, and also by the gateway are indeed very narrow and not really conducive to people with children and people with dogs crossing. I mean, the streets are simply way too wide. I think this is prioritizing uh, car traffic and making it very uncomfortable for people who are just pedestrians. And so I do see the value of the project. It looks it looks really nice, honestly. The uh, the mockups uh, look impressive, and this is something that I've been thinking about as well. So just giving you a fresh perspective here for somebody who moved here during the pandemic. I've been living here for about a year, um, and I'm hearing a lot of people say that um, you know things have changed over the last five to six years. Um, you know, things are different after the pandemic. Um, to me, just seeing this for the very first time, this seems like a very relevant change because what also changed during the pandemic is people started spending a lot more time outside and they're seeking places where they can just walk around without being next to other people. And so, um, you know, from, from that perspective, I mean, we have a thousand dogs living in Battery Park City. So you can imagine how often people need to be on sidewalks and pass by each other with dogs that may want to sniff each other. So my question here, I guess, is two, two questions. The first one is, when will be the next hearing? Like, when are you going to open this up to the community to review and maybe propose? Like, is, is there going to be a survey that's going to be sent out to people just to gauge what they care about now? And also, uh, who is the decision maker on this? Like, when will this be decided on and when is it supposed to start? And then finally, what is the actual impact in terms of, um, you know, I guess, tax money? Um, because I'm hearing that, you know, the proposal or the consensus here is that only the gateway part of the project is relevant still, but the one on the south side of the project is not. Um, and I just wonder, like, what is the saving and, and where if that money is budgeted already, what else can it be used for? So that, you know, we have a very tangible understanding of 
you know, what's in it for me? Like, what else do I get if I don't get this? Thank you so much, Thank Lana, so for much sharing. Lana, for please sharing. keep. Nick, uh, Nick, you're there. You're going to answer. Yeah, Nick, Thank you, you so much for sharing. Uh, I'm echoing. Thank you for sharing. And um, we need to get back to you. Please stay engaged so that you can have input and feedback as we go forward. Um, because I don't know, I don't know the dates yet, but I will, you know, we will keep you apprised of what's going on and you should be. Um, anyone yeah, else? Yeah. Wanna... Just, just in, yeah, can, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I I'm can. Sorry. Thank you. And thank you, Lana. Great to hear your voice. So, yeah, so we are, like I said, the RFP, which is the request for proposals would be out, uh, the end of shooting for the end of this month. So the way the process is, it's competitively bid. It goes out. You have uh, firms would bid on the proposal, get the proposals back. You'd have a, uh, an evaluation committee. They would uh, review the evaluation, review the proposals based on based on best value in terms of cost and services offered. You would have then the the firm brought on board, contract developed, and then the the, the firm would then engage with starting the design process. So. I would say later this year, probably at the earliest, don't hold me to it, Justine, because, you know, sometimes timelines are, you know, um, I don't, I don't have an exact timeline as I sit here. What I'm saying though, is once the, once the designer is brought on board and we're saying, okay, now we're starting the actual South end Avenue, West 10th street design process. That's when we would then say, okay, here's the public meeting. Here is the initial kickoff with the folks working on the project. Here is the next public meeting. So likely a series of public meetings throughout the, the end of 2022 into 2023, perhaps beyond as the plan is being, as the plan is being developed. So we are uh, at the pre-design phase right now, um, but we wanted to make sure everyone was caught up on where we are and now that we are about to um, put an RFP out from the design process, we'll be informed by many changes on the ground, no pun intended, uh, in the intervening years, so we would be able to account for and need to account for um, some of the very important changes that have happened in the interim. Thanks, Nick, Robin, and I think we'll close out this part of the bit. We'll go to the we'll go to the West, uh, West Ham section. I, I just I want to say something a little bit unorthodox, uh, Nick, mm -hmm. which is given the fact that this plan is you know has been on the shelf and is being dusted off and presented to, um, you know, uh, re with regard to the issuance of an RFP, I think that it makes a lot of sense to have a pre-discussion before you meet with bidders on the RFP. Uh, I don't know if that's a town hall. I don't know if that's a meeting with community board leaders and the authority uh, leadership, but I, I don't think that starting the process with this plan uh, as it would have been five years ago is really sensible in light of the things that many of us have said. Jeff has said, Pat has said, I have said. Um, and, and I think that it requires a little bit of a re, a tinkering and possibly a rebooting of the timing of the process. And I know that RFPs are very strictly governed, but I would ask you, Nick, and, you know, with assuming that others agree with me, that there be a discussion at the authority about how we bring this plan uh, to some more current uh, set of requirements before it goes to uh, a design firm. And that's it. Thank you, Justine. No, thank you so much. Um, I don't, I don't think Kelly, um, your hand has been raised the whole time. So I'm thinking you don't really have it raised, but text me if you do. No, I, I put it down earlier and he, he put it back up. Put it back up. So let's so call on him. Okay. That's good. New hand. Let's call on him. And then Kelly, you're last on this. Cause I want to go to the next section. Yes. I, thanks. Uh, really. Sorry, quickly. Kelly. Um, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I would like to, whatever we do when deciding, and I actually agree with Robin entirely, but uh, we need to have a process that takes a look up when we make a change, and I'll give you a good example, a uh, concrete example. When we do a change, we need to have a feedback, quick, 
revision of what the unintended consequence of that was. So we have the light at Rector, great, it's on the north side. That immediately had the effect of making the south side crossing 10 times more dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that would have been better solved if thought through with specific crosswalks, because I think what one of the things that happened is people assume that they have a light and they don't have to stop at the other corner, the drivers, right? So it immediately had a, a very dangerous impact that may have been easily rectified if we had a, a, sh a, a shorter feedback period of, of what the change was, if it wasn't caught in the original design. Um, so that's my comment on the central section. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. All right, um, sorry. So next, let's look at the north, um, the south section. Sorry, um, directionally challenged. Okay, so um, this area here was a big concern for folks that live on West Thames Street, um, and part of the concerns are how, in fact. People will be getting in and out of um, the garage that's on West Thames Street. Um, if we narrow the sidewalk, there'll be less room for folks to be able to load and unload. And if we put medians up, we were concerned about being, having trucks. When I say load and unload, that means like, okay, I'm going to pull up with a, my car or a taxi or a car service and unload my car, drop people off, or it means I'm moving into the building and I need to put a truck there. That's going to be parking someplace that's not going to be in the middle of the street and double parked um, or blocking the road because they can't be in the middle of the street. Now they do go in the middle of the street and then the road is blocked in one direction for hours on end because they have to do that. There's no place to go. Um, so anyhow, these are the things that were raised. Um, the buildings addressed it. Um, so I guess here we talk about the MTA buses and we had a good discussion about where to place them. Um, so they wouldn't be um, blocking traffic or blocking sight lines. There was concern every place along uh, where the bus stops were being moved because it was farther and harder for people to get to. But um, that's gonna be another discussion and I leave it to Bob Schneff to weigh in on that one. For that, um, the bike city bike station was gonna be moved closer to the greenway. And then I think the biggest thing was the sidewalk extensions because on the north side of West Thames Street, from South End Avenue to West, they're looking to extend it by 14 feet, which was just a huge amount. I mean, I'm sorry, Lana, I disagree. I think our sidewalks are pretty large now, and I don't know that taking the streets, my position particularly, and, and many of the folks that lived here were very much against going to the expense of doing that, and also were very much against putting in um, uh, medians that would block the whole uh, space because right now we still do have spaces for trucks to park. And again, ugly, but they're useful. And the um, condos did weigh in um, on each of these things, but I'm gonna stop talking because you guys can read the resolution. And I, I ask anyone on the call to weigh, to weigh in and have an opinion. Um, Mike Gordon, you were very, I, I, you were an attendee or you are an attendee. I don't know if you want to speak, but you were very, very vocal on every darn, and I don't see you here anymore. Um, and, but Marianne Braverman, you also were very much involved. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it and see, see about the changes. Um, anybody want to raise their hand if you know how to? Miriam may not know how to raise her hand, but I would love to hear from people. I'm seeing a little thumbs up sign. I don't know who's speaking, but uh, I saw the thumbs up sign. Bob Schneck, go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. I uh, am I live and heard? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, thank you. In the time you. when this happened, uh, I was I was very allied uh, with Gus, who was the uh, chief custodian of the Liberty Court building, and he was very, 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 very concerned with how West Thames Street was going to be handled. And he 
he practically thought that it just was a completely non-viable kind of uh, change for the community and that deliveries were even in those days really important and overwhelming and this didn't take them into account. I was very concerned about uh, the positioning of uh, bus stops, but that wasn't taken into account, it seemed to me anyway. I watched very carefully how Pat Smith and all those condo boards really worked hard to get resolutions going, and those were just kind of ignored. And so uh, it's interesting being involved with World Trade Center 5 and watching how a bureaucracy tries to take a very old uh, of, of some very old studies and apply them as though they're new. I don't think it's right. I think it. I think that the in this particular case, enough time has passed, enough changes happened that the res resolution should simply be withdrawn and revised with a new process and that the RSVP, although it would be very favorable to the people who are favor favored by uh, having such a large project happen and moving all that money around, I think that it isn't the right time for, uh, uh, for an RS RFP and that it's really, um, we really should revisit the whole matter really rethink it. It's not a good time for construction. Uh, the There's going to be so much construction going on down here. The question is how necessary is all this and how quickly is it going to bring the kinds of any kinds of changes at all that are actually positive. And so I think the whole thing really has to, I think, I think that it felt like the resolution was steamrolled into position that a lot of things weren't listened to even at the time. And now the resolution is very dated and things have changed very much. So uh, I think it's it needs a relook and a re-see. And it, one, some things that seemed important to me is that it really makes problems for emergency vehicles uh, if we do that. The Another thing is that once you widen those sidewalks and you actually have to move the sewers and things, that's extremely expensive, but you can't go back. And so I've seen lots of places where uh, the MTA is put up or the DOT has put up kind of temporary uh, temporary structures with, with bus stops and things. We could put a temporary thing there for a few months and see whether or not we really are better off with these restructured situations. In any way, in any in any case, I'd be very uncomfortable to vote to go forward with this resolution. Thanks so much, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, I don't see someone on the anyone on the committee with their hand raised, so I'm going to go to Marianne Braverman and then um, Barbara Ireland. Lucian's unmuting you guys, so as you get unmuted, unmute yourself and just go ahead and talk. I agree with almost everything that Bob has said, particularly supporting Gus's opinion, having been the super of that building for since it was opened, that it's not just uh, delivery trucks, but also service trucks, vehicles that are bringing, you know, air conditioners and things like that, and people with heavy tools to go in and, and do work. They need places to go as well. And um, I just d never saw that there was enough uh, room allotted for trucks to come and go throughout the day. So I, I don't want to see changes to the, uh, the West Thames Street. Also, in terms of the buses, since we're not th the most sensible thing, if we really want to focus on buses, is to have them leave the neighborhood at Albany. People who live north of there did not want that to happen, and that was taken off the table. If we're not going to have the the table and the specifics of at Rector, does it still make sense to remove the bus stops on West Thames and place them at Rector Park? And that's all I need to say now. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. 
I appreciate it. And yes, everybody here, um, I can't talk about Gus without tearing up. So, um, yeah, and also Marianne, I'm not going to make you tear up, but yeah. Thank you. Don't do that. I'm not, I'm not going there. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, just, just, just sending you much love on all counts. Um, Barbara, you. go ahead. Thank you, you go. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you for being here. Barbara, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Trucks and some other supportive things coming down South End Avenue to get to the Esplanade. Frankly, seems ridiculous that we're doing this now. We have um, a lot of ripping up of the streets that will take place after resilience, and that will give us a better timing of what the streetscape really needs to look like. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. That's a good point, too. We've got a lot going on, which brings us to the next topic, which is going to be uh, um, the resiliency at, at uh, the South Re Re Resiliency Project at Wagner Park, but I'm not going to jump to that. I'd like to jump to Pamit in case he has to go because I don't want to lose him. Um, if we are done with the South End Avenue, I'm just going to, with the comments, I see no other hands. I just want to sum it up and just say, Nick, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, please bring this back to your folks and know that we want to work with you and that the message here is things have changed. We've got new people here. Lana expressed a different view than most of us, but a lot of us have been living and breathing this back in the day a long time ago. So um, I know there's going to be a lot more meetings and I know you're going to talk to with us and, you, and there's going to be transparency and discussion. So let's just keep the talking going, but understand that uh, a lot has changed. We need definitely need change on the Liberty to Albany portion. And you're hearing a lot less change wanted south of Albany Street is what I'm hearing. And that that would be something that I would love the authority to kind of take into consideration. Thank you so much. And Pamit, I suggest that you start. Let's go. And um, Lucian, if you pull up Pamit's slides, so you folks know is I'm I'm holding on, I'm, I'm sticking Pamit in here because he did an amazing um, presentation on the ground rent, which might answer some of well, it won't answer about the cost of, of any of these things here, but it'll give you some ideas about why people are fussing about um, the cost of projects. And um, he presents the ground rent discussion in a totally different way that I think spoke to speaks to different people. So he's got a short presentation. We'll let him speak. So I'm going to limit conversation about it um, to like 10 to 15 minutes because we're we're you know, we're squeezing him in and I didn't put it on the agenda like a moron. So excuse me for that. That's all on me. But I pass this over to Pamit to go forward and let's go. Fantastic. Thanks, Justine. And I'll limit the presentation portion to about 10, 15 minutes and then certainly take the questions from there. Um, hi, everyone. I see some familiar names and faces, but for those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, uh, Pamit Serana, Better Park City resident for 17 years, um, own a condo in the south at Hudson View East and here on the North End at River and Warren and been active in the community for many years. Um, would love to take everybody through a ground rent 101, which is what uh, several of us at the Battery Park City Neighborhood Association have put together. Um, for those who aren't familiar, the Neighborhood Association was formed out of the Pause the Saws, the COVID memorial. And there's a great story behind that in that over the years and the 17 that I've been here, everything from Tire Park to the stairs at um, Brookfield to the COVID Memorial, our community continues to be more and more organized. And I think that organization is going to help us a lot in this ground rent effort. And so what we'd like to do is take you through really the facts and the data to the ground rent story. And I think much of this is often lost or forgotten, and we want to simplify this for everybody. So we have very clear talking points as a community and also clear facts 
So when anybody speaks to you, whether it's an official, a candidate, or the authority themselves, that we're using data that's publicly available. Sorry, there's some echo. Um, if others can mute, that would be great, please. Um, and so we'd like to have people walk away from this presentation with facts and data that they can question and discuss with those that they're um, meeting with. So the goal is here to get educated. And I think an educated community is a powerful community and one that is more organized is even more powerful. So with that, uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start with this slide because I think this is often forgot. Um, the Battery Park City Authority generates a surplus every year and has generated a surplus every year for many years. So there's a real fundamental question that we need to always keep front and center in this discussion of ground rent. Why are they even raising ground rent if they have a surplus? And we should take that in for a minute and let's put some numbers behind it. So buried on page 42 of their 132 page annual report is the summary schedule of revenues and expenses. And what you see here in these circles in the middle of the page is the ground rent revenue is 64.4 million. Civic facilities is 16 million. So they're getting $80 million in revenue from ground rent and civic fees to cover 16 million in wages and salary, other pension employee benefits, post-employment benefits of 3.6, and then 37 more million of other. When you put that together, they're taking 80 million in revenue and they're spending 58. And again, these are the two revenue sources that is unique to Battery Park. And so we have to remind everybody, those who think about the Leonardo DiCaprio's and those who say that we're not paying fair share, it is clear with hard data, plain and simple, from Battery Park's own documents that they are charging 22 million more than the operating costs. What we will not get into is whether it takes $58 million to run the authority, which is a different conversation, but we'll take it at face value. So let's start the conversation with 22 million of surplus. So any proposal that is short of a rebate is a fair proposal. And so I'll, I, I want everybody to take this in and we can discuss it later, but when somebody doesn't talk about this slide, I think it's fair to say it's disingenuous because this is the fact and this is the data. Next page. What this means, and this is a lower Manhattan issue, completely in the purview of CB1. And so I'll start with the right for a minute. So now that you saw the surplus, it absolutely supports an incredibly fair and reasonable proposal from the community that there's an absolute freeze. And that freeze would lock in that $80 million number because they're only spending 58 right now. And so over 10 years, maybe they'll catch up on those expenses, but we should not pay a penny more. That's the basis of the 10 year freeze and we can do 1% year thereafter. And why that's important is the situation that our community is in today is a direct cause of the authority increasing these ground rents and costs, which has caused the Leonardo DiCaprio situation that they themselves point to us at. That's an important fact here. And I think with using the, the theme from the other meeting, we, uh, the discussion, there's a new day here that there's an opportunity to change this and the authority can, and I think um, our elected officials can relook at this story and just take a breath back and look at the facts and the data. Because when you increase Battery Park City ground rent, it cascades to the left side of this page. The BPC owners, those who own, have a dollar for dollar increase in their operating costs every year. Those who rent, whether they're a landlord that's an owner or whether they're a big company that's a landlord, they always pass those ground rent fees down dollar for dollar. And when that happens, these small businesses that we patron patronize have upwards pressure that their landlords are gonna charge them because they're getting it on the residential. 
Now, what does that do? That has the butterfly effect. If you're charging 80 bucks a foot in overall cost for renting in Battery Park, you bet Tribeca and FIDI are going to raise to meet 80 bucks um, on their side. So anything that happens in Battery Park is happening in Lower Manhattan and their small businesses as well. And that has gotten us to where we are today, which is a reduction in affordability. So again, to recap, that's the simple story. And so all of these ideas of flip taxes and everything else is only going to exacerbate the very position that the authority has created. That's why a simple freeze, everybody, is a reasonable solution in lieu of a rebate. Uh, next page. So let's put some numbers behind this um, story. Um, but first, let's define something for those who are new. On the top left, buried on this slide is an example of an actual detailed bill from a condo. And you'll see those four charges, the common charge, civic, ground rent, and pilot. As a reminder, in this slide, you'll see those costs are on the left and the columns are who it's paid to and the four types of people. Because what we often hear, and we need to clarify this, as we shown in the slide before, ground rent affects owners and renters. This is not a renter issue. It is not just an owner issue. It is an everybody issue. It's a small business issue. It's our neighbors in lower Manhattan. So if anybody is saying otherwise, again, I think they're being disingenuous or uneducated and feel free to educate them. On the columns, let's go to the center, the BPC owners and renters. Common charges everybody pays, but we're going to show you there's some interesting data that Battery Park City owners actually pay disproportionately higher common charges. The next section is property tax. And again, this is paid to New York City, and oftentimes we forget that. We don't pay property taxes like our friends in Tribeca and downtown and everywhere else in Manhattan do. We pay pilot. Now, if you look at the small print, Theoretically, pilot should be calculated with the same methodology that New York City applies to non-Battery Park City folks. But again, the data will show we pay much higher in the calculations for New York City pilot taxes. Again, all that money is going to the city. The two we do pay, which is the ground rent and civic fee, which were those two revenue items from the first slide, 54 million and 16 million, is this $80 million on the bottom of the slide. Now, reminder to everybody, and this is the definition from Battery Park City Authority on the civic fee. The civic fee is maintenance of Battery Park City parks and public spaces. We pay $16 million a year as a community, but everybody else in Manhattan has their parks and fees covered in their property tax. So let's remember something. We're being charged a civic fee and we're being charged a pilot and the pilot goes to New York City. New York City is not supporting our parks. We're paying a double tax. So again, a freeze is absolutely justified when 16 million of the 22 million surplus is coming from the civic fee itself. So anytime we're talking ground rent, let's not forget the civic fee in this because it's an important number. And so let's get into some numbers on the next page. And it's hard to see everybody, so I hope I'm, I'm reading the audience well on this. You are, Pamit. Okay. Um, I'll get a couple more minutes, and I'll just quickly go through some of these data points here. Next page. This is a data table of all the buildings that have ground rents mostly within the coalition, oh, sorry, all within the coalition, but I think there's a few more not. But anybody on this call, go ahead and look at this slide, look at your column that's your building, and take a look at the rows that we have here. I mean, all are in the coalition. Fantastic. The 2022 cost, let's look at River Warren, the building I'm in, and I'm on the board, I'm the treasurer there. We pay four bucks a foot now of that ground rent, and 10 years from now, with the way it's scaled, it's going to go to seven. So that means it's going up about three bucks on average, a buck 50 over 10 years spread. If you own a thousand square foot unit in our building, you're paying $1,500 more a year for an entity that has a surplus. That is the basis for a freeze. If you live in Regatta, you're paying nine bucks a foot right now. You're going to go up. 
But if you think you're only going up 49 cents, you'd be mistaken because what happens to River Warren, Ritz Carlton, and Rector Square, how those negotiations go will affect your negotiations. So anybody who's thinking about ground rent and have been complaining, this is an opportunity to get in and get involved because what happens anywhere affects your building. And so on average, when you do the math that you see on the top of the slide, everybody one way or another is going to pay a buck or a buck 50 a square foot. Again, for an entity that has a surplus and excess revenue. That has many impacts, affordability, a hundred bucks a month in rent for some places, or in some cases, if it goes up two or three bucks a foot. So we're proposing everybody can save 1500 bucks a year for the next 10 years. That can help affordability. Next page. Now, if ground rent wasn't enough uh, as a surplus, here's some more bad news for Battery Park. When you look at pilot, and so what we did was we took data from Zillow and Street Easy. You look in their costs and common charges and taxes, and these are examples. You can go ahead and pull 50 more buildings. The story's not going to change. When Tribeca pays $13.60 on average for a property tax for the New York City calculation, that same pilot calculation ends up averaging $19 for Battery Park. So we have to ask ourselves, why is Battery Park's average 40% higher on property taxes that's going to the city on top of paying ground rent, on top of paying civic? Right. So, Pemi, just to make it clear, this is totally the pilot, nothing to do with the ground rent or civic Correct. fix. This is on top of it. Correct. So there's a lot of questions that we need to raise as a community of how to deal with this separately. But as it relates to conversations with the authority, this has to be a factor because this is happening to Battery Park City. And so when anybody brings up the, a conversation first, again, we tell them there's a surplus. Why are we having this conversation? And oh, by the way, we're also being penalized on the way things are calculated at the city. Now there's, for another date and time, several calculations of how Battery Park City is structured that creates this 40% increase. But again, this is Battery Park City being treated unequal. Next slide. And we can quibble 20, 30, 40, 50. It's a lot, it's material. Now, because of the way Battery Park was designed, what you find here on common charges, again, these are the costs that just go to the building, your salaries, your porter, your doorman, your et cetera. What you find interesting is another statistic that the cost per square foot of common charge ground rent and civic fees is 35% higher in Tribeca. Some of that has to do with the very buildings that because of the size and the footprint and the dimension and keeping everything in an organized build, the common charges in some of these buildings are disproportionately higher because they don't have enough units. That is unique to Battery Park. So you see higher common charges, plus in View East and some of those other smaller buildings being perfect examples. Net net, we're paying 35% more in common charges, ground rent and civic fees on top of the 40% in pilot fees that's going to the city. Next page. If you're not drinking by now in this meeting, maybe you should. Um, what does that mean? That means when you bloat all these taxes and costs, you're going to get higher rent. That is the law of economics. And so, for example, if you have, whether it's a landlord who buys a unit that wants to rent it, they have all those costs that they need to account for, which is the bottom row of this table, they're gonna add a 10% margin and they're going to have higher rents. When you have higher rents, that's gonna drive rents up. And this is a, an upward cycle of costs and a downward cycle on affordability. And I picked everything from one bedroom, two bedrooms to lovely four bedrooms. Everything keeps going up because of those bloated costs. And the next slide for the owners is what we all know. If you look at the price per square foot disparity, what you've done is penalize Battery Park City owners to the tune of 30% lower price per square foot. What does that mean? When property values in Manhattan go up 10%, that means somebody in Tribeca is gonna make $167 a foot, but that same 10% Battery Park person is gonna make 118. 
so that wealth disparity is actually hurting Battery Park City owners on top of the OPEX. So your Tribeca friend just made 50 bucks more a foot, even though you're in the same market and separated by one street. Again, all the more reason why a freeze helps the cash and the operating for those, an operating cost for those in Battery Park. Next slide, and I'm almost done here. So again, just to recap, all of this reduces affordability. And again, the irony and an honest conversation we should have with anybody, whether it's an elected official or the authority, when they talk about affordability, they are the ones who created this situation. They have a unique opportunity to fix it, at least with the freeze, to stem the lack of, or to stem the increase in unaffordability. Next page. What does that mean? Here's what you can do. Two things. Ask your condo association. We are happy to host this presentation for them. Annual meeting, one-off meetings, every one of those 20 buildings. We'd love to get this story out there before April 30th. And that's important for a couple of reasons. There's a legislative session that ends by June 2nd. Primaries are June 28th. And everybody should get educated. And one of the powerful things that we hope that our community can do is come out incredibly hard in the primaries because that is the only voice that our community has has if you look at what's happened we've had a district with two assembly members where one assembly member had two buildings now we were partitioned off into staten island and we are constantly treated differently the only avenue we have as a community is to vote with near 100 percent turnout and that message will resonate to the assembly member and to the senate candidates and that is how we can help get our story across, because I think we have can all agree we've been taken for granted and taken advantage of for many years now. And so we encourage everybody to get, engaged, get educated, get involved, find the people that you think the assembly member Senate races can appreciate these data points and these facts and are willing to, to support that. Those are all individual choices. We are not encouraging any specifics. We just want people to get educated because the facts are on our side on this one. It's pretty easy. And for those who would love to get involved and engage with the neighborhood association on the top bar there, uh, just send us an email. Hello at BPCNA.org. And that's it. Thank How you. So time, Justine. You did great. You did great. Right. Thank you so much, Pamit. Yeah. I appreciate it. And um, we have one question from Marianne Braverman, but I just have to say thank you because you present this in a way that's different than the way that I presented it. And um, it's a different look, right? And you're talking about affordability, but you're also talking about costs and value. And I love yeah. the I love the breadth of what you bring to the yeah. table. So um, yeah, this is great. Well, and all and my all my it. friends on the neighborhood association, uh, Kelly, Greg, Amy, Barbara, Brittany, everybody, thank you for all your help on this team. Yeah, no, they're, that they are wonderful, and you guys have did a really good job. And you've been living and breathing this for almost as long as I have. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you you get it too. Um, the only thing I want to say, because there's some new folks on here, is you know when you say surplus, the money that's left over goes to pay the bond debt, and that so, bond debt. So yeah, so say that. Explain. Okay. So yeah. first of all, if you go back to that page three or page two, what ends up happening is this surplus goes into what's called a joint purpose fund. Part of that fund goes to the state general fund, part of it goes to the city general fund, part of it goes towards affordability. None of it comes back to Battery Park City. That's the only math that we need to remember. That it is goes correct. somewhere else. So that $22 million of excess does not stay here. So when we're quibbling about some replacement of a park swing, there's $22 million that more than should cover that. Except they're paying the bond debt. So, Correct. so, so, so except a different, day the a different conversation, but it's, it's surplus revenue. And if you look here, it's, it's surplus revenue that they don't need to keep their lights on. Correct. And, and, to keep and that's, it simple, that's, yeah. what, what you'll hear the authority and, and Nick and BJ always say, you pay extra to live here. That's $80 million. And that's it costs money yeah. to live here. 64, uh, $58 million. Nick, BJ, George Sunis, 
Why are you charging 22 million more? That's the conversation. What they do with the surplus is a whole different conversation. We just care what you charge unique, that's New York State money, ground rent and civic, should not be more than what it costs to run. Just that simple. Right. Yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you, Plamit. Marianne Braverman and then Nick, who doesn't know how to raise his hand um, with this on the phone, which is fine. He texted me. And then and then Rob. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. And then Bob's next. So we'll, we'll do we'll do Marianne, Nick, Robin, and, and then Bob Schneck. So go ahead, Marianne, you go, please. You're you're unmuted. Thank you. I'll start with an observation that when Battery Park City Authority was created, the parks was a quasi independent unit. It was the Battery Park City Parks Corporation. And it's possible that that civics payment amount, which was put in the original legislation, was to support an entity that doesn't exist that way anymore. They they pulled the parks operations completely within the authorities operations. So maybe that in and of itself should wipe out the civic payments fee. I'll just sure. le leave you with that. Yeah. Oh, and Pamit, yes. this was great. Yeah. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've loved look, Justine up to now. I'm loving you too. <laughs> to now, uh -oh. <laughs> up to now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, you know, I have. Well, never mind. <laughs> I've, never mind. I've heard that the history on that civic off. fee, but like most government fees, whether it's tolls and bridges that are fully paid off, but they keep it in the repurpose. Yeah, right, right. Today, all we care about is what the authority uses that money for today, and they use it for parks. But Absolutely. if they use it for parks, we'll then dip into the two hundred eighty-three million that we're paying a pilot for and stop charging us for that. Right. That solves your ground rent discussion right there. It's right. it's that simple. Right. And then my other observation, I always felt like our pilot and our city tax was way more than other uh, comparable condominiums or apartment buildings throughout the city. And yet every yeah. year I'm told that the management company who runs our operations in, in my condo, that they go, go to the city and fight it and so on and so forth. And we have to pay what we have to pay. So, yeah. Uh, that's like off kilter too. And I thank you for just comparing us with Tribeca. It, and yeah. By the way, that's Tribeca, whose zip code is worth more than 102A2 zip code. Yep. Right. Thank so you for that reminder, that by the way. Yeah. I intentionally picked that zip code to prove a point that we're paying 43% more in pilot taxes than the fourth wealthiest zip code in the entire state of New York behind right. the Hamptons. So, yes. When you go dispute, you're you're operating under a, against a multivariable calculus equation of pilot that we're not going to fix overnight. But that's why I made the comment. That's something that the state and the authority have to recognize, and the data shows it. Yeah. They've always said we've been treated equally. No, you haven't. I just yeah. have data that's 40% more. So whenever the authority or somebody says we're being equal, I would ask that they present the data so we can have a conversation of facts, not on words. Right. Thank, thank you, you. me And thank you, Marianne. Marianne, you're done? Yep, I'm done. Thanks. No, no problem. Thank you. All right, Nick, you're up. Hey there. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Nick. Yep, we can hear you. Hi there. Hi, for me. Okay, great. Yes, it's important that we talk about facts because there's a lot of stuff that I think is being maybe not represented as forthrightly as it might be. So, to start at the beginning, okay. and thank and you will, for me. That Nick, it really is a very nice. One second, Nick. A nice if I may. If I may. No, I, I, request... I think it's my turn to speak now. For me, I think I, I, I think it's my turn to you speak. You can so rebut him, okay? Let, let sure, Nick have sure. his two minutes, and then you rebut him. So, the first thing I want to kind of correct is the claim that scheduled ground rate increases will add 150. I'm sorry, a dollar. Uh, $1.50 per square foot per year and cost to condo owners is just incorrect. The 12 um, buildings, now so. the buildings listed uh, here, were not- At least one building of that he spoke of. Mm -hmm. But the 12 buildings that negotiated significant ground rent reductions with the authority in 2011, 2012, pay today an average of $6 per square feet. And that will increase about 2.7% a year through 2038. So that's an average increase of 20 cents. 
20 cents okay. per square foot per year, so not a dollar fifty. That's, I have that's, to interrupt that's very important. To know Go that ahead. because each building's different. So you may be right with the yes, average, but you can't take the of you course. can't take that because every building has got a different increase. But go ahead, right. sorry. That's exactly why the buildings from 2011, 2012, we want to get the other buildings into that so they're paying less. That's the idea of eliminating the fair market value resets for the buildings that are not in that in that first group. Okay. And to the extent that the ground rent may reduce the sales prices for condo owners, I think we touched on that only tangentially, but that is a discount and also applies when people first bought their units. You were buying it at a lower cost because you're not paying for the land itself. You're paying for the land over time rather than paying for the land up front that the building is on. The claim that the pricing of rental apartments is driven up or down by ground rent, I don't I don't think that that's true because rent, as we all know, is a function of location. It's the building and what type of building it is, its amenities, where it's located, and many other factors. And landlords, by and large, will charge what the market will bear. So if ground rent increases or decreases, landlords are still gonna charge what the market can bear. And if you think that as a result of ground rents, let's say hypothetically being frozen, that landlords are gonna turn around and then reduce rent, I don't know, there may be a bridge I wanna sell you. I don't know that that's actually what's gonna happen. Landlords are going to charge what the market will bear. Okay, now the exception of course, is for the affordable apartments that us, that we, the Battery Park City Authority has sought to preserve and expand, as is evidenced by our recent announcement of preserving 70 affordable units at 30 to 40% of AMI for the next 50 years through 20. 69, that's a, that's, a, that's a good deal. So that's an example of us not charging what the market will bear. We were, we were aiming to preserve affordability where we could using ground rent as a tool. Um, the other thing that I think is, is important to say, it's not the only cal calculation that you need to know that we make, that we generate more money than we spend. If the authority of, as I'm fond of telling Justine, didn't exist, of course, then everything of what you spend would be going through to the city. So what's unique about Battery Park City for the uninitiated here is that we are able to fund everything we need in this neighborhood first before the city gets one cent of what we generate. Other neighborhoods, by contrast, will pay their taxes every year and will hope that they get a certain amount of money back to work on particular things that the neighborhood needs. In Battery Park City, we are able to spend entirely what we need first before the city gets anything of what's left. Now, of course, we can't spend it all because we generate just on pilot, which incidentally is not set at all by the authority, but that's set by the city council and the Department of Finance. And from ground rent, what is left by law needs to be passed through to the city to fund city services and affordable housing elsewhere in the city. But again, the reason why Battery Park City, in a way, well, it's true, right? The reason why it's such a desirable neighborhood is because it's so beautifully maintained. The reason our parks look the way they do is because we have a dedicated team of professionals who are committed to maintaining the parks to world-class standards. They are not New York City parks, and New York City parks are wonderful. But Battery Park City parks are a cut above, and there's a reason for that, and that's because money is spent to maintain them to the standard that we all have come to know and expect. It's that high quality of life that makes Battery Park City such an appealing place to live. The last thing I would say, Justine, and thank you for indulging me, is as we have said, we are committed to preserving the high standard of living, also meeting our fiscal responsibility to the city, which we have to do by law, but also developing solutions to help protect lower income Battery Park City homeowners from the ground rent increases they can't afford. I think that's a really very important thing to note, right? There are folks certainly in Battery Park City who may be on a fixed income or may really be struggling and have ground rent increases that they can't afford or manage, and it's incumbent upon the authority, as we have said before, and again, we will, that we want to try to make sure that we are developing um, solutions that can help them. However, I was just looking today on uh, Street Easy. I don't know if we can pull it up, but I was looking at some of the recent sale prices of some of the buildings in the North neighborhood, especially, I think it was Street Easy or whatnot, and I saw a couple of recent sales um, in the North neighborhood in Warren, two and two Warren actually, which is River and Warren. I'm looking at some of the recent apartments sold, 3.4 million, 4.5 million, 
5.5 million. These are beautiful apartments in a wonderful neighborhood. And I'm not begrudging anyone their success, of course. But I think it's gonna be a very hard sell to the public to say, someone who can spend $5.5 million on an apartment also needs public dollars to subsidize their rent. It's gonna be a very hard sell to the public. It's gonna be a very hard sell to the city of New York and to the Battery Park City Authority Board. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, all right, so I'm gonna respond a little bit to you and then, and then I will um, go to Bob and Robin, sorry. Yeah, and um, just if I can get a chance to just yes, to share yes. perspectives on those items as well would be great. Yes, I'll let you, speak. I'm sorry, I keep pushing the other folks back, but I'll let you speak since it was your presentation, but I'm gonna say first. So going to what you just stated about the apartments in the North neighborhood for those sale prices, I don't know the answer to that, but my question is to comparatively is, what did they pay for them? Did they pay more, the same or less than what they sold for? And I, we, I don't know the answer, nor would you, maybe it's someplace in there, but that's a question that lends color to your position. Um, going to your point about um, the landlords and how um, you're not so sure that landlords uh, increase rent based on the ground rent or taxes or decrease rent based on the, on, the, on the taxes or ground rent. So one thing that I heard and have heard in, uh, repeatedly from um, landlords, now not the gateway landlords, because they're not talking to me, but I'm talking about the, that sponsors and landlords in the condo buildings where they have apartments that they've owned and they rent out to other people. They say that they're not making ends meet because their condo charges, which include the pilot, the, the ground rent, the civic fees, and the common charges to run the building, are so high that they cannot make ends meet because they can't, even the market rate rents are not high enough to cover their costs. That tells you that there's a problem with the cost of the ground rent and the taxes and the common charges and that we're struggling. Um, you know, deals that you've made, oh, and then you said, how would, why would any decrease in um, ground rent or taxes be passed on from landlords to tenants? Well, <laughs> Going to Pamit's point about looking into your state legislators and being involved in elections, um, there's a bill out there that has been on the table and has not passed yet caused prohibition against good eviction without good cause. Part of that says that as long as it will be huge. Yeah, be it would huge. be huge. Right, exactly. the, the misnomer, it's not I mean a misnomer, but it gets tagged as good as as good cause eviction. And I have seen uh less than dubious fake news out there saying that that will hurt tenants and blah, 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 because who wants to be evicted? No, the full title of the bill is the prohibition against eviction without good cause. So if you're a tenant who has been paying your rent regularly, you know, put aside COVID when there's been, you know, a, a, a moratorium on rents, but you've been paying regularly, the bill says that your landlord cannot evict you, constructively evict you by increasing the rent by more than 3% or 1.5% of the CPI, Consumer Price Index. That gives people at least the ability to stay in their home year after year after year. There is no prohibition to the landlord as to when someone leaves what they're gonna charge for rent. That's what the rent can, the market can bear. And then that person comes in and pays with up increases. It doesn't mean it has to be 3%, but it's no higher than. And that is a way to push forward with legislation and with laws that control the growth of rental incomes. And that will help preserve affordability and preserve communities. And then to go to your point, um, one more thing about Tribeca Point. Yeah, you guys did a really great job and thank you for saving 70 um, apartments in that building and preserving affordability. Um, and again, this just goes to my argument with Five World Trade Center and every, even, even um, uh, at 250 Water Street and, and the Howard Hughes building. Looking at a place and saying, I gave, you know, and, and this is not fair, but I'm making it bigger than the authority. I give you 20% or 25% affordable housing, but I'm giving you 75 or 80% luxury. We have so many empty luxury apartments right now. We don't need any more luxury apartments. So, you know, if Five World Trade Center is public land, the Battery Park City Authority and Battery Park City is not particularly public land. This is privately owned ESH. We're a little division here. 250 Water Street is privately owned land. But I really think that we need to change the narrative here and stop focusing and saying 20% is affordable housing. No, it's not. 
there's been a huge decrease in affordable housing. And yes, every little bit helps, but we need more, we need to do better. And kudos to the authority for, for, for making 50 years of affordable housing at um, Tribeca Point. Kudos to you, but where? what's next? Where We, we need more. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna stop talking. Well, we're working I mean, on you it, go. Justine. We're we'll working talk, on it, don't we'll worry. Keep, we'll keep going and i know you i know because you've said so and i and i believe you i believe bj i trust you we've got to do more we got to do more faster pamit and then we're going to go to the the board here cuz i got a lot of hands raised just um a couple questions you know comments to to nick's points which which are not just nick's points but others have said this and, and there's some very very easy answers because whoever those are and nick i'm not just picking on you nobody goes back to the first slide in the presentation page 2 there's a $22 million surplus. That's where the conversation starts. So in reverse order to your comments, Nick, when when people say those who sell a $4 million property in North Battery Park at River and Warren should not get a subsidy, that's a factual incorrect statement. Number one, if we want to be equal, then everybody in New York City should pay the same thing that you want to charge somebody in North or South Battery Park. Number two, there is no subsidy because those people in the building that you're picking on, River and Warren, are paying a surplus on the ground rent. There is no subsidy. They are not getting subsidized by freezing it when they're in a surplus position. In terms of the city gets the excess revenue, it just doesn't compute to us as citizens why, if that 22 million in surplus doesn't go to the state, but it goes to the city, why the state is so insistent on charging people in the state jurisdiction only to give those $22 million to the city? One can only reasonably surmise that there's something in it for the state that's not in Battery Park that's valuable that that 22 million is going there. So again, you're not subsidizing anybody by freezing. You're actually helping affordability in the situation. When you talk about ground rent increases, it does lower the cost and the value of a property when you compare it to other properties. When you increase a ground rent, so then that example that on the slide, um, for that common charge for that two bedroom, two bath in Hudson View East, a person pays $8,400 a year. That's $700 a month in ground rent. When you increase that by a buck a foot, $100 a month, if you do nothing else, somebody who wants to go to Fannie Mae and get a mortgage can afford $100 less. And a mortgage at 4% interest is that's about $70,000 of value when you do the math. So you are losing because it's a fixed cap on what somebody can afford on their, on their mortgage affordability. And again, Nick and others, our values are lower. So when lower Manhattan goes up 10%, Battery Park is not. And that is, again, never addressed. When you talk about landlords, I, I've yet to meet a landlord who says, I want to charge less and I want to take a, a loss when I go rent. When markets are great, they're going to push the boundary to the top end. But when they're not, they have to cover their fixed costs. And those fixed costs are the ground rent. And when they go up, they can't afford it. So I don't ever understand this whole thing about the market rate when it's said so simply, because it's not that simple. Um, I'll leave it at that. And then the 70 units. Fantastic, but out of 16,000 units in Battery Park, that's 0.004%. I'm sure Liberty Lux got a good deal on the other units. So I think that's a decent start, but we what's, have to fix the other 16,000 that are paying a surplus. Agreement that you, uh, the agreement that you have. Uh, Thank you, Pamit. Appreciate it. So Bob, Snap, you want to go next? It's a home equity loan, right? You're, you're, you're off the... They can mute themselves. Uh, that's yeah. what it is. You can mute him. We can get someone else. I don't. I don't have the power to mute him. But Bob, if you want to go, if you want to go, Bob, you got. I'm going to try to keep it to two minutes because we got a lot of people now who want to talk. So let's go. Yeah. Bob, speak if you want to. Yes, I do. 
Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I'm really not sure where to start on this. And so uh, I think I'll start at, at, at the beginning of my own story. When I bought this, I fell in love with the community. I had moved in here from San Francisco and I thought it was uh, uh, terrific. And I moved in here and uh, I thought it was a, a little overpriced, but then I did, and it was really a pioneer venture at the beginning in the 80s uh, to move in here. But the lawyer said, don't do it. <laughs> he said it wasn't a good idea, and then I could go over why it wasn't a good idea, but it really was It turns out that it really wasn't such a good idea to move in here and to pay what I paid for so many years. I've been paying here since 1988. Uh, and the reason I moved here is because it's beautiful for one thing, and because I really believed that America doesn't have unhappy endings. And that even though the rules that I signed up for in the covenants were absurd, uh, things would change and they wouldn't happen. Then uh, my bank withdrew my home equity law because of the covenant that kind of goes, that ends in 2069. So I've been. I've been paying substantial fees to have an own to own a, a, an apartment here to have it confiscated in 2069 as the rules now stand. That's completely insane. It's insane that that should be left on the books. It's insane that that hasn't been changed, but there it is. The next thing is that when I just acquired an apartment here, I've owned my apartment here. I've had it paid off for more than 25 years. Costs are so incredible here, I can't hold on to it. There's no way any accountant showed me that I could hold on to this and rent it. I just am not, you have to be super wealthy even to live here and continue to own the thing you've owned for 30 years already. It's just unbelievable the amount of trials that we, we face to be here. And it's clear as a person who just bought an apartment here that the values of our apartments on this side of West Street are less than by some substantial amount than the other side of West Street. Those are concerns that I've actually experienced, and it's really been disappointing. But to, to me, I'm concerned about the bond liability. We, Battery Park City has run, run up astounding amounts of bond debt over the years. And when I've asked in open meetings of BJ, what happens to that? He said, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay it. Well, my name's on the, oh, yes. anyone who's an owner here is lined up for that liability. And so for me, how yeah. is that treated? How do we avoid that sure. liability? Well, what you have is, I think about six series of bonds that add up to $875 million. And those payments are all based on the excess revenue that's get paid out. Again, this goes into one of the reasons why Battery Park City is, is a great vehicle for the state and the city, basically to issue bonds outside of the general funds, right? And, and the 99 year lease, by the way, they're gonna solve that one on their own because they have $875 million of bonds that need it. So they're going to solve that on their own. We don't even have to ask for that. If that doesn't happen and they can't sell units here, that's going to affect their calculations. Um, the ground rent, again, which is what this is about, has $22 million of excess that's going to the city. We don't understand that. It's not fair, right? If you want to tax everybody fairly in the city, well, then tax everybody $22 million, you know, whatever base that is over and do that to them. You want to put a flip tax on Battery Park? Fantastic. Put it on the rest of Manhattan and the other four boroughs. Yep. Um, this is about equality, and I think that keeps getting lost in this, and they just keep picking on. Um, so back to the bonds, sorry, is this is about bonds. I mean, the essence of this, and this is part of getting educated, right? The more we get educated, the longer these conversations happen, the more we get educated, the more we're going to learn, right? And so I, I hope this ends quickly, because I think everyone can just be satisfied, but those bonds streams are coming from this ground rent revenue, period. And the pilot is being increased by the city, one can make the case, to support more bonds for the funds to go to the city and the state. This but is why our for community it. has to get educated and be clear that we have been overtaxed 
And that is a true statement. I'd, lead, I'd love somebody to convince me we're not overtaxed because you're going to have to defend the pilot 43% data that we showed, and you're going to have to defend the surplus. And, and I want to have that conversation in the same breath of everything else. And I'm happy, to have to that con I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. We keep using the word surplus. It's not surplus. It says revenue. You use the word surplus. Excess 22 revenue. million more maybe, maybe, of excess revenue. Maybe, yes. Yes. Yeah. It could be it could be $300 more. Why charge we're it? Not we're not charging it. We're not charging it. We are not charging it. It's what comes in and we are spending what we need here first. Can we go to page two for if, a minute of the deck? Yeah, so, if, so if, Ned, if, this would be if, helpful. If, if we're we're spend, both of you guys if, stop, okay? We're playing if, if semantics we were here because I know where you're it, going. If, like, wait, wait, because I can say we for you and I need it. to call on other people. Wait, stop. You, what ahead. you're Press. saying is, is, is very clear and I understand it and I also see where Pimit's going, all right? So, but I want to make sure that the people who are uninitiated are understanding it. Okay, That's, that, the money we take in, I we're going to take in Nick, no matter what. I think you've you've done this many times before. Pamit has done it many times before. I have lots more to say, but other people have their time to speak. Let's go, so other people. So, you two guys are done for now. The other guys have a chance to speak. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everybody, be enough, quiet. Bob. Let me let let me let Eric talk. But before he speaks, Nick, I'm going to summarize it. At the end of the day, what Nick is speaking about is. And I'm going to have the, not the numbers that Pamit was using because he was looking at 2021 numbers. I have memorized now because I've said it so many times, the 2020 numbers. But at the end of the day, the Battery Park City Authority collects more ground rent than they need, than they need whatever percentage, 22 million more ground rent than they need to cover their costs to keep the lights on and to pay for whatever they pay for or everything else, just to keep Battery Park City running. There is a surplus, which is not the right word, but there is an excess amount of money that then is held 22 million in 2021 that has to go pay the bond debt down, the debt servicing. There's not even enough money there, though. They have to take some of the pilot and they have to keep increasing the pilot to pay for the rest of the bond debt because the bond debt is 70, no, 70 no, million dollars. No, no. Well, I know it's all mixed up. No, I know you're not, all mixed that's up. Not right. That's not right. Uh, that's not right. That's not right. The pilot has nothing to do with the bond issuance. It has nothing to do with the bond issuance. It's, it, the pilot it's, is set by the city. Done, it's, it's assessment has no, nothing to do Bob, with the I bond issuance. I have to correct issuance. incorrect information, Bob. I have to correct incorrect information. I don't think your information okay. is correct either, but, you know, you're done. <laughs> okay, Bob, stop. Bob, it's correct, Bob. Nick, you've got, one, you've got 30 seconds, and then I'm going to Eric. And then, and then Lucian, please okay. mute everybody. Oh, 30 seconds, and then thank mute. Thank you. Thank you. All the money we take in comes into one bucket, whether it comes from ground yes. rent or student facility fees or pilot. It comes into yes. one bucket that the authority uses. The first thing the authority uses with that money every year is to pay the debt service on its bond to make sure that they're covered and we can do wonderful things in the authority, like maintain the parks and build resiliency projects and keep the neighborhood at work for us level. And then the second thing we do is pay the operating expenses, which makes the authority run every day, the programming all the other things that we do as an authority. Everything that is then left after that, by law, has to then be directed into either the city pilot or the general fund. Correct. And it is apportioned as a percentage of roughly the same percentage that it came in. So roughly 80% of what the authority pulls in every year is pilot, which is not set by us and not determined by us. We simply collected Correct. it, set by the city of New York and set by the city council. And roughly 16 to 17% of what we collect is the ground rent. So when it's all done and paid through to the city, roughly 80% of what's left goes to pilot and roughly 20% goes to the joint purpose fund. But the pilot does not go no, up. You, you don't mean pilot, we Nick. Issue bonds. Nick, you don't mean oh, pilot. Okay. Nick, you just mean just no, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in here. Your pilot does not go up because we issue bonds. Correct. That's correct. But no, you're right. saying pilot, okay. you mean Thank the general you. Purpose fund, but let's stop. I'm sorry. It goes, it right. goes for to the general. Yes, it goes to the to joint for, purpose for fund. For Justine's instructions, yep. I'm going to mute everyone. All right, just for a second. Uh, Justine, I see that. I know you're going to call on the hands. I also want to um, alert you to a couple of hands in the attendee section. I'm aware. Um, so okay. yes, no, I see them. I've already told Brittany offline that because I, I can't text okay. her properly that she's waiting. Got I it. see Matthew's raised his hand. Thank okay. you, though. I'd yeah. like to go to Eric. Go ahead, Eric, and then Robin. I, I, 
I kind of want to just put like a human element to it. I I think I'm frustrated because what I don't hear from Nick is solutions. I hear just like this is how it is, and what I hear from Commit is a solution. And I uh, I've had a good I brought this up before. I've had a good friend who was told he texted me the other day. He was told on December first that his he had to move out because the owner that he was running from could no longer afford to have the apartment. I can't afford this anymore. She she didn't. Uh, increase his rent. She just said, I got to sell the place. He had to move out. His child goes to daycare with my child. His child's been a little difficult with now moving to Brooklyn and having new kids and all this stuff. Um, she just, the, the owner just reposted, re rented the apartment for $5,500. They were paying 4000 So in 30 some odd days, they were out January 30, 30th. And 30 some odd days, she increased the rent by $1,500 because people around here are increasing it by $1,500, whereas two years ago, it was not this high. So I'm frustrated because we're pushing out real people, hardworking people. It's not like this guy, you know, he has a very good job. He has, his wife has a good job. They have a baby on the way. And now they're being told that, well, I'm not making as much money as I could. So you have to leave, which means you have to leave, which means potentially I have to leave, which means leaving this board. We're not putting a, an actual human factor to this. And it's, it's frustrating because we're just bickering back and forth and I don't hear solutions yet. I don't hear how are we going to actually fix this and how are we going to keep the people that are already here and renting and paying the ground rent and paying the monthly fees, paying the civic duties to stay here. So that's that, that's what I wanted to say. I appreciate both. Thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate it. For everybody. A freeze, everybody will help. Everybody. Yeah, no, it will. Agreed. And and I think that is a, a solution and I, I hear it. Um and yeah, so so there is frustration on all sides. Robin, you're next. I'm sorry, Eric, can I ask a question about the person you mentioned from the human perspective? Go ahead, one second, quick though. Sorry, so the, the person who's raising the rent, do you know, are they, are they, a, are they a, a, a condo owner who's subletting the unit or is it a, is it a landlord in a rental? They're an owner. That's what I understood it to be. So it's a, it's, it's so the person who's, who's raising the rent on your friend is a condo owner who's raising the rent on someone who sublets the unit. They did not raise the rent. They said that they were selling the, the apartment because they could no longer afford it. And then 30 year, 30 days later, just wound up putting it back. As a rental. Okay, and you're saying the landlord then should the be landlord, subsidized. The landlord is the owner of the apartment. The owner of the apartment. It's an individual landlord that's, or maybe they own more than one, but it's an individual landlord that's owning the apartment. Right. Go go ahead, Robin. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Just quickly, I um, it was a very interesting presentation, Pamit. Uh, and I wonder if it's something that can be shared with us. Yes, I don't happy know if that's to. something. Yeah, um, I'm happy to present it to your building to any organizations. That's what the BPCNA is happy to do, and our goal is to do that just to get people educated. Right. Well, I think it's really important, and I would like to think of it in terms of a larger audience. So I'll work with Justine or Lucian to get a copy of it. So, and that's, that's all. Perfect. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. All right, let's go to Brittany and then Matthew. So, um, Brittany, it's your turn. Lucian's going to unmute you and then you can speak. Go ahead, Brittany. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. Good. So I think it's good, healthy discussion um, to have, and I think it's important um, discussion. I will say just a couple of things, and I think Pamit echoed a lot of um, my thoughts as well, um, very eloquently. But, you know, to the point, you know, first and foremost, to the point that, you know, reading out um, values of apartments sold in North Battery Park, I also just looked on Street Easy. I'm looking at Tribeca, and I see similar two bedrooms, $5 million. 4.7 million dollars you know so when we talk about values in a particular building in a particular neighborhood you also have to look at what's happening across the board in all of the neighborhoods i mean if you go uptown you'll see 10 million dollars in the village you'll see 20 million dollars you know so i think it 
you know, you have to, you can't take numbers out of context. And I think that those reading out numbers, Nick, was a little out of context. Number two, the other thing I'll say is, you know, if you think about it, not even in terms of rent, you think about like in a restaurant, right? I grew up in the restaurant and, and food industry. And if if the the raw cost, the operating fixed raw costs to run your business goes up, whether it be like raw food costs or your rent, anything, you raise your prices. It's 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 simple supply and demand. Yes, I agree, landlords are not necessarily gonna decrease the rent prices. But I can tell you with certainty, if you increase the prices, they will increase significantly. So it's very simple economics. It's, it's, it's microeconomics 101, right? Then the third point I do wanna make, the third point I wanna make is really going back to whether it's surplus, access, et cetera, that $20 million or so. I guess the question I have for the authority is, if you need to increase the prices, wh why? What are you using it for? Are your costs going up? Do you will you no longer have a surplus? Like, what is the purpose? And when you talk about going to the neighborhood and to programming, that's enjoyed by all of Lower Manhattan, right? First of all, but second of all, is you? I don't feel like I have a say in how you guys allocate your costs and your budget. It's not really we're not fairly represented. We're taxed without a say of how the money is spent. And it goes back to the fundamental principle that we've been asking for is if you're gonna tax us, if you're gonna increase the taxes, we need fair representation, plain and simple. It's American democracy. So there has to be some accountability here. Thank you for so much for letting me speak. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, um, Brittany. I appreciate Trust it too. Me, can I yeah. respond? Uh, for 30 seconds now. Okay. So thank you, Brittany. Yes, I would agree. There, again, remember, we are not the ones who are taxing you. Okay. Pilot is set by the city of New York, not by the authority. We collect the taxes. We do not set the taxes. We are simply a pass through mechanism for the city as a condition of us administering the neighborhood known as Battery Park City. The example I gave with the apartments wasn't just an example reading out prices. The example was someone who can spend that much money in an apartment does not need a government subsidy. So, and I would say the same thing oh. for someone who spends $10 million in an apartment. But we're not being subsidized. Like, yeah, that's the point, that, Nick. That's, no, I guess you're I would have to agree. You are asking, I have you're asking with to Brittany. be subsidized. Yeah. You're, a, no. you're asking to be subsidized. No, but you're we're not. No, we're not. We're not. Let's be very homes. clear, Nick. Be very, that's very funny. clear with your words because it's yeah. not a subsidy. We need to go back to the definition of a subsidy. We're absolutely, this is, does not count as a subsidy. And what I'm talking about is the ground rent, right? Yeah. You guys do set that. And you're setting these principles and you're the setting ground. the budget we, we, that we, goes, hold on, Nick. And you're setting the budget right? that goes to operate Battery Park City without representation from the community. It's, there's not fair representation, period. So as you think about Brittany, increases, and, and, then you need to think about how the voice of the community comes forth in it. And, and and I know, Nick, that you don't set who goes on the board. The the, the governor does, but we're asking for a majority of people on the board right. of the Battery well, Park City Authority and we also don't, and we also, and we also don't set ground. We also don't set ground leases unilaterally, right? Ground ground leases are negotiated between the authority and the buildings. Yes, it's con it's right. it's that's what I'm right. talking about. Yes. Right. So, yeah, no. and, and you know, any agency in the, in the government sets its own, you know, sets a budget based on what it is. Um, but to say there's no input, I mean, Justine, I think you would agree with this in Lucian too. We are probably more transparent than the, any government agency you deal with. And I'll say that and expect that you would say yes, because I know it to be true. It's true. And, and part of it is. Thank you. Listen, listen to Thank this you. part of the conversation, Nick, because part of what you were hearing in the conversation about South End Avenue was that we want to spend less money because we want the ground rent reduced. I understand that, but again, frozen. The, the fundamental so, so argument I'm is, trying to make, and I'm sorry if I've been unclear, if we don't spend yeah. the money in Battery Park City, it goes through to the city anyway. So anything That's, that we spend here is spent for the benefit of Battery Park City. If we don't spend it here, we don't get to keep it. It just that, means more goes through to the city and less stays here. That's the entire point. If we don't and spend it in and then we the might not, more. then we might need less money, right? Exactly. We spend smartly 
then we need then we don't need as much money. It's not you cannot use money as a use it or lose it. That's the yeah. wrong attitude. Right, but that's I do yeah, want in, in the mean, idea of a that subsidy. That doesn't mean the pilot goes down, and it doesn't mean the ground rent goes down. It just means that no, you're still staying you, the same. You're just getting less here. I hear you, Nick. But what I want to say to you back, and this is where Brittany's going, I think, from what Panit's point is, yeah. as we are negotiating right now to do ground rent revisions. Well, not negotiating. But we're talking about it. Yes. No, no, I don't no, want to right. no, I don't mean here please. on this yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean in this meeting. Yeah. You know this meeting. I mean. yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. We, as there are negotiations going on to, to renegotiate the ground rent, the contracts that are in existence, mm -hmm. the contracts that are going forward, part of the equation is that this, that the Battery Park City Authority needs to collect and generate revenue. So we're saying for the city and for itself and for the state. So if we reduce the amount of costs associated with running the Battery Park City Authority, there is more revenue generated for the city and where else it's going to go. So there is value in this conversation yeah. and having a discussion about about reducing costs, which is why I go back to saying also no more bonds or whatever. Or we have to be very careful about the bonding because all of that are costs that have to be paid. And my point of saying that at this point in time, the bond debt that I last saw was $70 million and the operating, which it's got to be higher. But the operating expenses of the Battery Park City Authority are 30 million, 40 million dollars. There is that difference of a surplus, but but there's a surplus. It, it's the wrong word. I don't like that word surplus. There is no surplus. You're exactly right, Nick. There is no surplus. That way I would is not how I would phrase it. But what Pamit said is exactly correct. It's overtaxed if you want to pick the right word. Yeah, that's, let's use that, that's Brittany's right. point. Brittany's yeah. point is overtaxed. The ground rent and civic fees is determined by the authority, and and Nick keeps bringing up pilot and is trying to spin it differently. We're only talking about ground rent. This whole conversation has been about ground rent. The ground rent is taxing more than the costs to run the distinct BPCA activities and expenses in their annual report. It's that simple. And that's the only point that they're tax to me. It's not a tax. It's not a tax. If we're the talking about words, so it's rent. Meaning, what is it? It's not a tax. It's rent. It's rent. It's you renting the land Nick, on which the buildings are built. Nick, I'm I'm just speaking to, me, to you trying to simplify. Words, it. words either have meaning or they don't. It's not tax. It's rent. They it's do. Different. You can call it excess revenue. You can call it surplus. You can call it over tax. Whatever it is, it's the costs are less than whatever's being charged, and that's the only conversation the community keeps having and it keeps getting yeah. spun. There's $22 million of whatever you want to call it more than the costs. And we don't hear what the authority is doing about that instead of saying Leonardo DiCaprio and everything else. No one, you, and, and Eric mentioned this very clearly and you didn't respond. We're not asking you to respond today. Take it back. Oh, I can respond. I can that respond. Says, I have responded, but I'll respond please. again. Go ahead. Let me finish the 22 million of more revenue than operating costs is the basis for the freeze as a solution. The representation is another issue. All those other things are additional, but there's 22 million more and the ground rent that you're charging or want to discuss with other buildings is simple. Don't do it for anybody else. And all those that you have previous agreements freeze everybody because there's 22 million that you don't need that's going to the city. Thank you. Okay, can I respond? So, um, so we should have others. I, I need to let Matthew go. I, it's I, getting I, later I, by the I, minute. I, I, so, so I no, need to other respond topics to certain things, though, Justine. And we do have more I, I, to I talk just, about. I, I, I do need to respond very briefly. So to answer Eric's question, I'm sorry, Eric, I kind of got pulled in a number of different directions. Well, we have said repeatedly, and I don't know how many of the conversations or meetings you've been in, we've done this a number of times over the past year or so. The authority stance is, yes, there are certain fair market value provisions built into ground rents that we agree wholeheartedly are as unsustainable and need to be changed. We're talking to the tune of 6% of the fair market value unencumbered. We agree that's unsustainable, and we want to work with buildings to make sure we are reducing that number, as is evidenced by the Tribeca Point Agreement, where we're able to preserve affordability in exchange for a change in the ground rent calculation. We want to do that with other buildings. But the suggestion that buildings essentially will freeze what they are paying for the land itself, which 
continues to increase in value. It's not something that we can do. And Brittany, I'm sorry if I was maybe using a word that maybe wasn't the most accurate. I'm far from an expert. What we are saying essentially is these are public dollars because the land is publicly owned. So using those public dollars to essentially give back or have people who can otherwise easily afford it pay less money is not the fiscally responsible thing to do. And the city of New York would tell you the same thing. The city of New York would easily say, Battery Park City, look, they wouldn't call it excess revenue and they wouldn't call it surplus. They would say, every single one of those dollars is ours. It's the city's. We let you keep some of it to do what you need to do in the neighborhood. But they can easily, as I always say, say to BPCA, guys, you know what? You've done great. We're taking you over now. And then this conversation is completely moot because I don't think your taxes would go down and I don't think your ground rent would go down. You know, that I would agree with. I think that if they've been used to collecting yes. this much money from us, they're going to keep taking that much money from so, us. Bottom but, line is we want to do this in a responsible way. We want to make sure we are eliminating untenable ground but, rent increases, Eric, for buildings that can't afford it. And we do want to make sure that people who are struggling to make ends meet, who are, who are owners and renters, and find a way to stay in Battery Park City, but we cannot do it for folks who are the one percent of the one percent. Nick, I got to tell you, I think there are a lot of people here who are living paycheck to paycheck who would be considered um, upper middle income. Um, we are happy to have a conversation. We're yeah. happy to do. We're happy to one percent of the one percent. Uh, like we are I mean, like, having the do. conversation, but Nick, stop. We are having yep. a conversation. We got two more people who need to talk, and then we got to talk about and fight about <laughs> the black department. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm but, sorry. Um, no, I'm no. Sorry. But what go I'm going to say to you is that we are having this conversation to, to go through this all, and people are living paycheck to paycheck, no matter what their paycheck is, and that's what the authority's not grant understanding. Yes, Leonardo DiCaprio at his millions of dollars per movie and whatever else, he, he is not. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Comparing even people who are making you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. If they live paycheck to paycheck, because that is the cost associated with what their building is, to turn around and increase the ground rent at five percent, fifty percent, or whatever, and it will put them out of their homes. And it's disingenuous. We're not looking at five percent or fifty percent, just in case. You are. Look no at the ground rent increases per building. The, the right. ground rent, which is what we want to, which is what we want to eliminate. Yeah, I'm not talking about the, the fair, fair market, market values. Research. I'm talking about the the an, the an, the annual increases that have existed and been in place for the past, at least that I can see, past 30, 40 years, um, and that I've been able to see okay. in records of. So, so it has increased. Okay. Anyhow, let's let you and I stop talking because I want to give Matthew a chance and then Kelly. And I really am going to say, Lucian, after like a minute of questions, you got to shut people off, and then we got to go. Wanna, back you want to give someone a minute of talking and then mute them? Maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, let, let's do a minute of question and then give an answer. If there's going to be an answer, I give him right, two everybody. minutes. Come on, good. two minutes. Okay, everybody. two minutes each. That's fair. Rob right, is saying I'm, I'm muting. I'm muting mics in two minutes, everyone. All right. Justine. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Lucian. Yep. You go ahead. You're unmuted. Okay. Um, I feel very lucky to have come in right behind the two minute limitation, but uh, number one, I'll start with Pamit, great incisive presentation. The only thing I would take issue with is you cite correctly the unfairness that if you live in the Bronx, parks go into your taxes, but if you live here, you pay twice. Absolutely correct. The only problem with that is that's what, low six figures? We're in the mid nine figures for resiliency, and if you live in the Rockaways or Breezy Point, that's folded into your taxes. We're paying the same or higher taxes here, but we're now going to saddle a multi hundreds of millions of dollars burden to pay twice for resiliency. But let's go to Nick. Um, Nick, you keep ignoring a crucial distinction. People asking to be bled less and to be extorted less is not the same thing as asking for a subsidy. That collides with this false narrative about DiCaprio and the three worst words you said tonight, easily afforded as if everybody here who, who might benefit from a ground rent deal can easily afford it because we're all Leonardo DiCaprio. That is not only a false narrative, it is a divisive and harmful narrative. 
and it is an excuse for doing nothing that is absolutely unconscionable. Moving to, yeah, I didn't uh, say, I didn't say his I name haven't finished tonight. You actually, I, you, I wrote I down when it. you said it. You said Ken easily afforded about ninety seconds ago. Those are your exact words. Keep going. Keep going. No, I will keep, yeah, Leonardo please don't DiCaprio. take that from my two minutes. Leonardo DiCaprio. Nick, this is not your turn to speak. Nick, wait your turn. Talking. You'll have a chance to answer. Yeah, Nick, I'm trying to make this okay. organized. Robert's rules. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Matthew. You got you got okay. your time back. Nick, um, was the 2011 condo affordable affordability deal, was that a subsidy? Was that fiscally irresponsible? Was that a giveaway? The 2011-2012 condo deal 11 this, buildings were in it uh, yes or no or here, Nick. Added. was that an irresponsible subsidy and giveaway or was that a legitimate move by the battery park city authority it saved building owners 280 million dollars over 30 years was that a legitimate policy decision by the battery park city authority or was it a lavish irresponsible giveaway to rich people i wouldn't say it's a lavish lavish giveaway i'm saying the amount of money it saves people that's, that's the facts I have. I don't want to speculate on opinions. We're I'm giving you facts. We're asking 30 for the seconds ago about can easily afford it, but now you don't want to characterize what the authority actually did that you're relying on as precedent. Second question, what did condo owners give back in exchange during that negotiation for the $280 million? Without the deal in front of me, I don't know. I would have I'll to supply you the it. answer. The correct answer is they gave back nothing. Two hundred and eighty million dollars just to preserve affordability, which raises the question: Why are you now nickel and diming condo owners by demanding an eight percent flip tax, a commitment to fund undefined resiliency upgrades on property that people here don't actually own, all the while characterizing this as a subsidy and a giveaway for people who can easily afford it? Either the 2011 deal made sense, in which case you should do it again, the way it was done in 2011, which is to say, in exchange for nothing, no concessions, no givebacks by condo owners, or you have to be prepared to say the 2011 deal was insane and it was a giveaway to rich people and the Battery Park City Authority should never have done it. But I don't see any daylight between those two positions. It's one or the other. Matthew, that's your time. If, if you want to respond one minute, okay, please. And thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it. Um, no, I'm good. I, you know, again, like I said, we want to continue to work. I didn't use the fellow's name. Uh, I think a person who can afford $10 million on an apartment or $6 million on an apartment, it's a hard argument to make that public dollars should go to reduce what that person pays in rent. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, and then let's go to Kelly, please. Kelly, you're hey, muted. Hey, <clears throat> thank, you. When you start. thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Tammy, uh, thanks for doing this and thanks for the, uh, the presentation. I just want to anchor for everybody back to what I feel is a first principles argument, right? Higher costs, however they come, However, bucketed they are, civic fees, pilot fees, taxes, ground rent, higher costs affect everybody's affordability. Owners, renters, small businesses, everyone. So that's an anchor. That's a first principle. The higher the cost, the, the less affordable it is. Second first principle is fairness dictates that we keep the loads, the total loads, which is why I like Pamit's presentation. This is all about total load of Battery Park City residents relative to the com comparables across the street and in like apartments and like. We're so far out of the market that we're not talking about minor things. We are far out of the market and it's a problem and it's already affecting the neighborhood. We're already squeezing people who've been here for long periods out of affordability. That's a problem. The second thing is I think everyone on this call and practically everyone in the neighborhood certainly wants to keep this neighborhood affordable and accessible to a very large, diverse number of people. However, I do not find it in the mandate of Battery Park City Authority to independently be in the redistribution game. If we want to be in the economic redistribution game, 
we have a lot of agencies at the state and the, and the city level of, of elected political officials who can take care of that and do take care of that. So when we start to pick winners and losers of, of changes to a ground rent, we are going to dig ourselves a hole economically that we will never get out of. So this is a first principles argument. Rent is rent and it should be fairly cal calculated on comparable land and use um, that keeps this place as affordable as possible, right? And that we're not in the business of picking winners and losers. Okay, thanks. And thanks, so, Tamit, for, uh, for the discussion. Justine, can I respond briefly? Yeah, you got a minute to respond, Nick, yes. I won't even need that much, thank you. Kelly, well said, we agree. We agree the rent should be fair. And none of the entire issue is deciding on the number that both parties can agree on that's fair, the value of the land. And that's kind of what is making this as complicated as it is. But yes, we share the goal of keeping the neighborhood as affordable as it can be. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the answer, Nick. I see Bob Schneck. Bob, you've got two minutes, and then Nick has a minute to respond, and then we're going to move on to the next issue, I think, because I see no other hands. Oh, no, Detta had her hand raised. Detta, I would go to you first if you still want to speak because Bob has spoken already. Is that okay? Detta, do you want to speak? Unmute yourself and go ahead. I'm sorry. Or was it Rosa? I think it was Detta, though, whose hand was raised. Or Rosa, but neither one is speaking up. So put your hand back up again if you want to go. But Bob, go ahead. I don't need to go at this point. I think I think this is discussed through enough. And so, but I do want to say that in all the years I've been here, I'm right across and just above the the Rector Street Park on the on the east side, and we are down to 15% of lawn cover. The rest of it just got eroded away. So the quality of the uh, maintenance really has gone downhill over time, and I think that's true over the over the whole area, including Teardrop Park. And it's especially, I, it's clearly disappointing from here, and I, I'd be happy to send you a picture of it. Thank you. Go ahead, Nick. You can respond if you need to. Yeah, Bob, certainly. Send me what you got. We'll get right on it. Our parks are uh, a pride and joy in addition to the the people we serve. So certainly want to do it. There was uh, an issue in Rector Park, I know, I think we wrote a letter in the broadsheet about there was a curb valve that needed to get replaced and there was kind of a long process with the city and getting the permits. So that's why some of the lawn there was a little thin, um, but anything else you have, great. And Justine and actually, and I were walking through Teardrop Park tomorrow on another item. So sure, send it along and we'll take care of it. Thanks so much, Nick, for that. Um, all right, so I don't see any other, any other hands. So let us move on to the next topic, please. Um, Lucian, would you pull up the agenda? And thank you all for this. And Nick, I know you've gotten lots of earfuls about a lot of different things. Uh, some people were harsher than others. Thank you for being patient with us because you know this is a really important issue for all of us here. And there are many of us- I know it, I know it well and I share, I share the concern. So, yeah, it's it, everything here is said with respect and um, appreciate your being here. And so, thank you. Justine, um, Nick, thank you both for the opportunity. Yeah, and Pamit, yeah, sorry, I'm getting distracted because I've got people coming in and out of my house now, too. So, I'm a little, a little bit distracted. Pamit, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you all for all your comments. All right, let's talk about um, the timing and staging of the resiliency pro projects. Um, I think we're talking about South Battery Park City, right? At this point, um, Wagner Park. And Nick, I think this is on you. Yes, I'll be I'll be very quick. I know the air is getting late. So, Justine, when we talked about this and Lucian as well, what I mostly wanted to do was to direct folks to the Environmental Protection Committee on March 21st. We've had this calendar now for a while. Um, and we will be uh, presenting on two weeks from tonight to the committee about the next steps in scheduling for the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project. We gave an update as kind of to whet your appetite so they get caught up. We gave an update on January 24th as part of the LMC or quarterly meeting. Um, we went through kind of a rundown of each of the projects. 
Um, Lucian, I'm sorry, I'm not on the screen, but on my report, page six, there was a quick little bulleted list of um, Hold up. updates for the resiliency projects. Yep. So, and I can go through this now, just not the full report, but this section of it, so it makes it shorter later. Um, but net net, the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project will be updating, as I said, the EPC committee on Monday, March 21st. A number of you were on the draft environmental uh, draft environmental impact statement um, public hearing we did back in the fall. Um, it's now being reviewed uh, by agencies and will be issued publicly in April. And then there is an, an EIS public hearing on that statement um, in the May timeframe, along with 100% drawings for the RFP for so the final two construction packages for the South. So very, very briefly, what it means is we'll be in front of the committee on March 21st. We'll be looking to go to the Public Design Commission uh, likely in April for the final submission package for what the PDC needs to review. Um, and then looking to begin construction on the South project in the July timeframe ish, but we'll be back obviously with updates, including on the 21st between now and then. Um, as informs all of our decisions when we do work, we we'll to obviously try and minimize public impact while delivering on what is certainly a vital priority for the neighborhood, which is to protect it from storm surge and sea level rise. So more to come on the 21st, but if there are questions between now and then, please send them to me. We can certainly work them into our presentation that we make two weeks from this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick, for that. Rosa has a question. I'm going to let her go. Go ahead, Rosa. Go ahead. Thank you so right. much. Um, I was wondering, so if you're anticipating to start in July, when are you anticipating completion? It should go through, you know what, I, I'm so close to this stuff all the time. I should know those offhand, but stand by. <laughs> stand by. Let me pull it up. I believe it's going to go through 2024. Okay. Which one is going to go through? Project. The, the okay. South? Wagner is going to tell. So, so it's going to be two Wagner. years? A year and a half? About two years. About, about a year and a half, two years. About that. Yep. Let's see if I have it right here. Yes, I will have, I'll, have, I'll, have a firmer, I'll have a firmer timeline for you. I'll have a firmer timeline for you on the 21st. But yeah, roughly, uh, roughly two years, I would say. And we don't have any pictures yet of. Um, we don't have any pictures yet of what the building's going to look like. Oh, no, we have it in the report and then I can send it in some of the presentations we've made as well. Yeah, but in no, my report okay. on page. Uh, is that little one? Wait, I do see the, the the very far away, but I'm 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 wondering about. Yeah, I can I can send I can send some bigger ones. Or Lucian, uh, what I'll do is I'll put in the chat some of the older the uh, some of the presentations we've made. But yeah, we've done the we've done a, a bunch of times a bunch of different angles of the new pavilion. Let's see if I can pull a good one up for you. Um, and then the other thing I would note is just seeing this is of interest to you. And I know this committee has covered it as well. The question about interior drainage as well. We'll be talking about that on the 21st. The good news that we were able to bring forth was that those control houses that we had spent a good yes. number of yes. uh, resources and time on, looks like they will now not, again, repeat, not be necessary due to uh, our working with, with New York City DEP. We're going to find a way to do the interior drainage in a, in a different way. So if this is the first you're hearing about it, folks, don't worry about it. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we won't have to build these fairly large structures. But more to come on the 21st. And Lucian, I'll see if I can get you a couple of good pictures of the pavilion to put in the chat. That is so so useful. Thank you. But yeah, okay. So I can see yeah, here yeah, yeah, um, sure. in the middle. This is this is from this side. What I wanted to present to folks, and I know that it would be nice to have this committee um, be party to the conversation. I want to present the other side, the view from uh, uh, the Ritz Carlton, well, the Wagner, I guess it's called now. But I want to see that oh, side because that's street. more controversial. I mean, this is controversial because maybe people like it, maybe they don't. People don't want the trees cut down and replaced. People don't want the building bigger. But then there's real concerns, though, on another level of what it looks like from the other side. And I know that you guys made some changes. I don't know where it ended up just because I just got busy and didn't. I know you've presented it. I know I don't know it. So I was hoping this could be. And, we'll, and we'll go through it again on the 21st with some of the change, some of the. There's not a whole lot different, but it's based on what was approved by the city parks department and others. Let me see if right. I kind of find a good view of it. I think we might have done something in April. 
Okay. Go. Thank you. No, sorry about that. Right. And Rosa, if no, your hand is still no, raised, it's okay. um, we can talk about that I'll, now. If I'll lower like it now. Oh, okay. No, just making sure. I wasn't sure if you had something to say. I think Thanks, we, Rosa. I think that Brittany might be gone. No, she's still here. I don't know if you have any questions, Brittany. This is not as a, as detailed as I thought it would be, which is fine. Um, I know Brittany had asked me offline if uh, this would be the detailed one or the environmental committee would be the detailed one. Oh, hey, Brittany. No, no, yeah, yeah. EPC on the 21st. And we're also trying to set something up. Uh, I don't know if Brittany's still there with the neighborhood association as well. I know they're starting their own um, kind of resiliency committee. Yes, they are. And what I'd like to try to do with them is get them right in on that. We can get, we can get folks who are smarter than yep. me. Um, in with them to kind of read them into the catching up because different people are coming at it from different at different points. And I want to make sure we can get people read in as best we can in terms of where we are. So actually, Brittany very kindly texted me last week. She was trying to get one more person on the committee. But when we have that, we can set up uh, we can set up a standalone session with the neighborhood association as well and get them read in on all the projects. I know the north, um, especially is of interest to some folks, obviously in the northern end of the neighborhood. That makes sense. That makes sense. No, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So then maybe we can, we can move into your, um, is that the next, I think this might be the last thing. I think as part of your report, there's some folks who are from the dog runs that want to ask some questions, but, um, we're going to put a, we're not going to go into a crazy long agenda on that, you know, discussion on that, but they may have some questions or some issues, but you just go forward. You're in charge. All right. Let me go. Let me go relatively quick. Uh, and Lucian, bear with me. I'm sorry. Again, I'm not on the screen, so I'm just going to speak as I go through the pages. And if you would, I'll give Do it your a, best. I'm going to keep up with you. Yeah, if you can give it a beat, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of go through. Um, okay, so we had the Ukrainian Running Club New York uh, closed there in period clause. You'll see that on Saturday, March 5th. So we should have started the meeting with this, or I should have at least. But uh, our thoughts are prayers with Ukraine, and we can. Continue to stand with them. So we're glad we were able to have a great shot of them there at Peary Plaza on Saturday, um, and that's the that's the featured item there. Uh, COVID is still with us. Obviously, it is uh, merc mercifully it seems to be uh, waning. Nonetheless, I boiled down my bullets a little bit. Still, we have some information on vaccines, and then I've been doing each month, Lucian, as you go into page two, is there are COVID testing sites um, in not immediately in BPC, but in the immediate vicinity in Lower Manhattan. So I've kind of mined those out from the city's website, entered the 10280 zip code, 10282 would get you the same places um, with places that you can, with locations you can go to get COVID testing over the next uh, couple of days and months. So those are listed out there on page two. The bottom of page two, just a quick note to say, and obviously Justine and, and Kathy are no exception and Robin and the rest of the team, Marcy's Women's History Month, uh, you'll see a, a small, uh, collage there of some of the, the women really driving progress at the Battery Park City Authority. And let me say that in a personal matter, on a personal front, um, you know, our chief financial officer, our general counsel, our vice president of real property, our chief of staff, um, you know, top level staff in our organization are women and are really making Battery Park City as great as it is. So I am honored to be in their presence and they're, they're really a bunch of pros. So happy Women's History Month and uh, may it ever be so. Spring 22 program and events guide at the top of page three, Lucian. Um, you've all uh, seen that. If you're on the mailing list, it's in your inbox, it's online. It is also available in the 10 most common, 10 common most, 10 most common non-English languages. So those are all linked there as well. We hope to see you in our parks and we have some, some great events coming up that leads into Lucian, the, the bottom half of page three. We know our annual art exhibit is on view that features art from folks at who participate in Battery Park City art programs. We have the virtual art exhibition that's uh, running on YouTube as well. In person can be viewed Mondays and Tuesdays through March 29th from, from 1 to 3 at 6 for the Terrace. Outdoor Adventures is coming up on Saturday the 12th. That's next Saturday. That's a really great event for the kids. We will have, obviously, another great two women, Julie Flores and Mariki Bender, will be doing a nature walk through Rockefeller Park for anyone who wants to um, to attend RSVP, it's free to attend with RSVP um, if you can at that link. Early spring gardening is starting. That's the top of page four, Lucian, on uh, March 15th. That is a five session, um, it's a five session program, free, obviously, also to attend. 
and BPT Cooperstown Camp coming up on March 26 from 9 to 12 in Rockefeller Park, just in time for what we hope will be baseball season if the lockout can be resolved. So uh, that's coming up in the parks as well. Very, very exciting. Bottom of page four, we started a great new art series. It's called uh, BPCA Present, Presents Public Art on Video. I've linked to it there. But what it is is a little bit of a deep dive. They're not super long, but they're short little video vignettes about some of the artwork we have throughout Battery Park City with a new video dropping every Friday coming up. This Friday is South Cove. And following Friday the 18th is Irish Hunger Memorial. But we have a, a nice introduction to the, to the program. And then uh, not super deep dives, but nice dives with some of the artists who worked on the, the world-class art collection uh, that calls Battery Park City home and that we work that we work uh, diligently to maintain. South End Avenue, top of page five, we've done that, so we can skip right through it, Lucian, thank you. Parks Happenings at the bottom of page five, just to give an idea um, to folks about what is happening in our parks this month. We try to do this every month. I won't go through all of them, but we are doing some uh, irrigation system improvements plant and pest uh, management to make sure that our parks stay um, the state of world-class destinations that they are, tree and shrub pruning to make sure that the trees are staying healthy, compost applications in different areas of the parks to make sure that they are ready for spring. Uh, and in Rockefeller Park, you will notice at the bottom of page, uh, bottom of page five there, um, we've included a, uh, an American kestrel nesting box in Rockefeller Park that's pictured on page five. The American kestrel is a very small uh, native falcon. Um, and as part of making Battery Park City a biodiversity haven, we are uh, installed a kestrel box there to uh, see if we can draw the falcons here to Battery Park City. Really, really cool um, stuff. And the last thing I would note at the top of page six is we are conducting our park and street trash waste audit. So as we continue to work to be and build on our green legacy, we are um, encouraging folks to, again, try to reduce, reuse, or recycle what you bring into our, to our parks, um, just as we do at the authority. When you can't, of course, please make sure that you're recycling. We have the bins pictured there. Our longer-term goal is to try to reduce the amount of waste in our parks by 90%. So if we can divert 90% of what would otherwise go to landfill, we are, uh, we are really leading the edge here on what it means to be a sustainable community, and you are all to thank for that. Um, park lawns we know are closed uh, for the winter to reopen in uh, mid-April. We'll see if we can't push to perhaps get them open a little earlier. I don't want to commit Ryan to it. Because um, again, Bob, part of what gives the lawns a chance to heal from very uh, heavy use over the, the spring, summer, and fall season is the ability to be closed in the winter and kind of have some of that new seed um, take root, going back to some of those concerns about areas that the lawns may look thin. The Battery Park City ball fields, uh, the summer and spring hours are now in effect starting March 1st. So the spring, the ball, excuse me, the ball fields are now open from 9 from to 9 p.m. daily, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily. They've just been re reconfigured last week for baseball and soccer format. Um, so that's really exciting. And going from one ball field to another, the resiliency project to protect the Battery Park City ball fields from sea level rise and storm surge. Um, has been complete. The construction is done. There are some understory plantings and new trees that need to be planted in the spring, but by and large, the protection is in place. So you'll recall these are the fields that were destroyed as a result of Hurricane Sandy. We have now been able to, working in close consultation with the community, uh, to install that protection around those fields. So they are, um, you know, they're no longer susceptible or as susceptible to uh, to storm. So. 50,000 local youth a year use the field, and they are now protected from, from flooding. So uh, we are glad to deliver on that. North Project, we talked briefly about. There's some working going on in the north. Kelly texted me and Justine texted me. There are some geotechnical borings being done in the, in the north to get some of the sampling from underground, which is if you see um, some, uh, a vehicle parked in the north, that's what that's doing. It's not construction starting. It's Reconstruction geotechnical work, and I put a blog post up about that as well, linked there. And the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project at the bottom of page six, we, we talked about. Okay, programming highlights, Lucian, I'll speed up here on page seven. Thanks to everyone who gave blood again. BPC has been like a 
pincushion throughout the course of the pandemic, and I can't thank you all enough. Um, February's Valentine's Day blood drive resulted in 83 life-saving donations from the Battery Park City community, and that's in addition to the 63 that we uh, we were able to uh, to secure during January's emergency blood drive. So thanks everyone who donated blood. Uh, we look to have another one coming up in May, day TBD, but I will be back to the committee next month with when that will happen. Thank you again so much uh, for helping replenish New York City's blood supply. Um, the New York, the Battery Park City Open Community Meeting uh, we had on February 16th. Thank you all who attended that as well. We have the video and the presentation from that evening linked here too, um, as well as some key takeaways. And as may not surprise the folks who are on the call, we spent a not insignificant amount of time on ground lease uh, discussions as well during that meeting. Um, and you will see there in some of the key takeaways in case you don't have the hour or so to watch the video, I will emphasize again that we are working to expand affordability and certainty with the tools we have, specifically ground rent, as evidenced by our past agreements, and that we agree with condo owners that there should be an alternative to the rent reset formulas in the leases. That goes to Eric's question earlier about what the solutions are. But again, it needs to be a fiscally responsible one, and we're working on developing to that end a framework to help those with a demonstrated need to stay here in, in Battery Park City. Um, Mardi Gras House, what we did on March 1st, that was really fun. You'll see a picture there of the house, uh, park house decorated with uh, some festive decorations. So thanks to all who attended. Ready BPC we've done a couple of times, but that's still up because although it was beautiful today, it may still snow, it is March after all. Um, let's see, and that is mostly it. Lucian, you can go to the top of page nine. That is, I think all not the same, but it's it's stuff that gets repeated each month. We just updated our board meeting notice, and then the top of page ten, which is the final page, mercifully and thank you. Justine, we covered at the very start of this meeting, the two events coming up. So yeah. again, just for the benefit of the of the team here, the 9/11 Memorial Museum and Run 5K that's on the April 24th, um, and then uh, the the Colloquia School, if I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. That's Dutch King's Day. That's a smaller event on April 30th. Um, we should likely have some more events coming down the pipe when I'm before you guys in early April, but that would be in early May or in mid-May, so we would have some time there. And Pat started off the meeting with his number, so that's it, and thank you for indulging me. That's perfect. So, Nick, thank you so much. Um, next meeting, just as a preview for folks, we're going to talk about uh, dog runs and some of the issues that this new group of dog owners as Brit are bringing forward, that'll be on the agenda next month. Um, I had a question for you. Yeah, we're not gonna talk about it tonight. It's late. It's, it's almost nine o'clock. But um, no, go ahead. Late. And then, but I, have a, I had a question Justine, for you. This is why I come home. This is I why know, home, right? You know? There you go. So I'm I love in the it. office. I'm actually home. There you right. go. But um, go ahead. The the question I had was about the temporary relocation of uh, art. Were there any decisions made yes. yet? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so we're still. We're still, I have to pull my notes up because I want to make sure I don't misstate it. We're still proceeding down what we had discussed. We had first discussed it with the committee and then there was there was an additional yeah. kind of shift. Yeah. But we are still assuming that we can go with the relocation of one piece of art to the, the west end of Rector, one at the end of first place, and then um I think one, one was another second place, I think it is. Yeah. And you think they fit? I know right. you were looking at it. I'm right. Sure so nothing has changed fit. since that assumption. We just are doing, I, I have to check cool. on that actually. I know we were doing the analysis to make sure that it can bear the load. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. All right. Just let us I know. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. But okay. I would, and again, and as, as, as is our want, if there's a change to that and we can't do what we think would work, we will be back to you to discuss different options, but obviously the, the goal is to keep this art in Battery Park City and available for folks to enjoy uh, for the duration because it's okay. public art and it should be enjoyed by the public even while we're doing um, the necessary resiliency work. Thanks so much, Nick. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, we really need to keep talking with the affordability and the ground rent situation because time is of the essence. This, I know you're working on it and I know we're having conversations, but we need to get this done and we need to get to get it done soon. So that's something else too, but I put that out there and um, I appreciate your, your work. I appreciate your time tonight. 
I know you were kind of a punching bag, so thank you for that. And um, I hey, thank everybody we, we for being here. You know that. I know it's part of it, and I'll see you tomorrow. Does anybody have any Is questions or anything for Nick? I don't want to cut everybody off. Come on, there's got to be more questions than that. No, I think we're done. I think everybody's tired. They got spoiled by the first the, the, two, the first two meetings of the year, which we were done really quickly. This was a long one. So thank you all for hanging in. Appreciate it, and um, I'll see you all next next month. I think we're done. We can turn the recording off. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.